when you were racing James, what was that experience like? Demoralizing, for sure. I mean, you weren't beating him, right? Unless he cracked. And I, I'll be honest, I would just try to hit him. Me and my brother would be hammering motos. I'd be out carving a cliff. To be honest, I almost went freestyle. That's how I grew up. I just, I free rode. Like, I got a picture of myself at Bud's Creek, and I got, like, one of those, like, three bike lights. And I was racing the outdoor series, and I was, I didn't want to go back to New Mexico, so I ended up living in my truck for two months. And uh, I bought up a little roll-up mattress, put it in the back of my truck. I'd sleep in there, load my bike up, go riding, train, fly to the races on the weekend. So not typical. I finished that half lap, no helmet, wide open. Jumping all the jumps, AMA freaking out on me. Dude, I retired. Do whatever you're gonna do, I I'm done. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by AG1. I want to give a big personal thank you for the help in getting me to the start line at Glen Helen for the World Vets. It was a real bucket list thing for me and I spent all of 2023 training for it. I may have skipped a couple of runs and had a few off days at the track, but one thing I didn't skip all year was a morning started with AG1. Consistency is everything in health and fitness and one scoop of AG1 with water first thing in the morning every morning played a massive role in getting me on the start line. I feel more energized, I have better digestion and I have a higher sense of general well-being as a result. That's because every scoop includes things such as B vitamins for energy support, probiotics for gut support and vitamin C and zinc for immune support. And while all of these attributes make AG1 a real no-brainer, you can try it and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3, K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash gypsytales and keep an eye out for our World Vets content dropping here on our YouTube channel soon. I think we'll be good on this yeah. one. I've how's been looking that? forward to doing this how's one. How's that? Is that too high? Is it no, okay. no, I think you're good. Right. Uh, I've been looking forward to doing this one, like I said last night, that my peak era of motocross was like probably 04, 05, 05, like that era is when like we started to get cable in Australia. We could yeah. follow the races live. Like before that, you'd wait for a DVD. So you, yeah, like yeah. it was real hard to be like an actual fan in a or you just read about it or see pictures like yeah exactly yeah. yeah so i had like all the magazines and stuff so it was like i feel like 04 west coast lights <laughs> was, was the year, year that I, we finally got tv to follow the races that was and, a good good year to and, i mean that, i guess who was the year. man that year <laughs> so that was uh yeah that was my no that was a good peak. era for for motocross supercross is it was i mean i think that was the peak of it in my opinion but of course that was my my era so of course yeah. i'm gonna say that <laughs> but i mean it kind of was in a sense you know like you had you had carmichael it, you supercross was built on jeremy yeah and then the torch got passed to ricky and then you had this dude in the 450 or the 250 class that was the man you had chad reed you had kevin windham you had like pastrana was still yeah, in and pastrana, out yeah. like mcgrath was still in and out and then in the 250 class, you had James, which like heir apparent. And then there was guys like you, then the PC era. Yeah. It was when amateur kids would come out and be like fast as fuck. So, and that was kind of the uh, PC kind of had a dry, dry spell there for a little bit. And that was kind of the start of it, right? The yeah. Four stroke came out. I crushed it that year. The following year, Langston came aboard and we both crushed it. And dude, they had a good run. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was just a, it, it was like a, I don't know, f to be a fan, it just felt like there was so much to be a fan of, yep. in a sense. And even down to like your teammates, like Matt Walker, just <laughs> so, like that guy is yeah, he's so a unique and he is. cool in his own way. And it's like, I just, I don't feel like we have guys like you or guys like him in the sport especially in the 250 class. It's just like it's so just, watered down now, you know? I think, I think for myself, I, 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 I grew up different than, say, a lot of the motocross racers that, these days. You yeah. know, I, I grew up in New Mexico. I was kind of just a snowboard, skateboard kid. Um, but my brother always loved dirt bikes. And 
when I was, I think I was eight years old, he, he talked my dad into buying him a dirt bike. So I was like, oh, I want one too. Started crying about it. He got me one. And I basically just followed him around. He just, he was diehard. He loved it. He looked was at he all the older mag- than you? Yeah, about two years older. Yeah, yeah. And uh, basically that was the only reason I got into it. And I wasn't that into it. I was into riding. I wasn't into racing that much. Like I raced, but there was plenty of times I would, I would go to the race. I'd ride the first moto and then be like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> or my dad would be like, dude, I paid the entry fee. What, what are you doing? And the next weekend, he'd be like, you sure you want to race? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then same thing. I just want to go hang out with my buddies. Um, but I don't know. Something clicked at, at some point. About I'd say about 14. I was like, okay, I, I got some talent at this. I'm good at it. You know, let's let's give this a go. And I wouldn't say I took it serious because I, di- I didn't start taking it serious training and all that until later. Um, yeah. So I kind of knew, knew what to do because back then I just I rode my dirt bike, went and raced it went snowboarding he just was that kind of kid and uh i just had some talent so i was able to yeah. show up and do pretty well yeah and i think that's kind of the difference nowadays right like you and you would see your character it's funny i said a thing in the rv pod where it was like if you don't have your own character people like no matter what people make their mind up and people create you to be a character yeah and with you i had this idea that you were like a bit of a badass like different too because of like i guess family heritage did you do you have like what is your family background so uh well i grew up in new mexico yeah um so my mom's side i'm, I'm a quarter uh, mexican quarter yeah. italian which yeah. comes from my dad's side tedesco and then i'm not sure what the rest is to be honest with you i never got one of those tests done or anything but um yeah, I think a lot of it was just where I grew up. Um, I grew up in Albuquerque, which yeah. and I grew up on the rough side of Albuquerque, which yeah. is, is really bad. I always got that vibe that you yeah. were the kind of kid that liked getting in trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I was definitely that kid. Yeah. <clears throat> definitely that kid. And uh, I grew up in the in the ghetto, basically, you know, um, small two-bedroom, one-bath house in the ghetto and, you know, lot, lots of gang activity and there was lots of trouble to get into. And, yeah. Um, when I about middle school, um, I started getting into that trouble. Started hanging out with those kids, and that was about the time I would say like I I wasn't that into racing. I just wanted to hang out with my buddies, cause trouble. Yeah, because um, that shit's and, so fun and I when was, you're a kid. I, yeah, and I, I honestly I I wanted to quit racing. I just I was just like yeah, screw this. But I was too scared because my brother was so into it. My dad had so much invested, and in obviously we were racing across the country doing the whole deal. So <clears throat> for me, I. I I was scared to tell them, and then, like I said, a few years went by, and I, um, my parents pulled me out of school. We we got uh, homeschooled, and that's kind of when it, it turned for me. I, I got away from all the, that crowd. Yeah, started uh, traveling around, taking taking racing a little serious. Yeah, it's crazy when you're a kid. So I grew up in a pretty. It, it was like. It wasn't a ghetto when we first moved there, but then like we were there a couple of years and then the town bought like a bunch of the blocks of land around and like built housing commission basically. So like we were a fairly normal family and then like right next to us was just full housing commission. And But I was friends with all, they were the kids that I grew up with, you know what I mean? Like I didn't, you don't know that much different. You just know like, oh, he's got a BMX bike. He likes making BMX jumps and Man, some of the kids that I hung around with, their parents were fucked up, right. dude. You know, yeah, and it's like you don't was, know that as a kid. It was crazy. Yeah, I thought it was like that Normal. everywhere yeah. until you know I started traveling around racing. I'm like, okay, there's <laughs> someday I'm getting out of this place, you know. Yeah. And if I was never exposed to other places, I probably would have just stayed there. And you know, who knows what would have ended up. Yeah, you know, because it was bad. You know, there was drive-by shootings on my street. You know, this. I mean, it was it was it was pretty gnarly. What was the gang activity there like? Was it because it's so close to the border? Well, is Albuquerque close to the border? Um, not Albuquerque, so that's kind of in the center of the state. Okay, um, but but it is like a border. I think state, a lot of right? the gang activity came from, like a lot of them were like LA gangs that kind of went out that way. From what I understand, I don't. I was a kid. I didn't. I just knew the names of the, the yeah. gangs and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I was lucky to get out of there, be honest with you. And yeah. and I moved out to California um, when I was about 17. And I lived in Paris, California, basically in this, like, <laughs> in the ghetto again. It was, you've been to Paris, like dirt, dirt <laughs> yeah. roads. So that's where I ended up. Uh, this guy was uh, Gavin. He was he had a little track in his yard. And I didn't even know the guy when I showed up. He just, it was a buddy of a buddy, came out um, yeah, and stayed there for about a year and Man, roughed it. I'll be honest with you, roughed it. 
the those I feel like those times build so much character. Yeah. You know, and like yeah. if you if you compare to these days, like it's it's not anyone's fault, you know, like you kinda want kids to have a good life, but it's not like for sure. You have these kids that they just they're homeschooled from day one, they're f- facility kids or it's like they're just living that life show. like there's not that much development in yeah. a sense in like a real world sense and no, yeah, i yeah. always got that vibe with you that like fuck i feel like hot sauce could probably steal a car if you need to <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, it's just where i grew up and, yeah um yeah i mean even even once i turned professional i i, I signed my first deal with plano honda which was a privateer honda yeah. team out of tech plano texas and uh so, so I, I moved to Texas, was riding there, and I was, I was staying, staying with a buddy. But um, they were, it became a point where, like, dude, you can't stay with us anymore. And I was racing the outdoor series, and I, was, I didn't want to go back to New Mexico. So I ended up living in my truck for two months. And I was flying to the outdoors. <clears throat> and, you know, I, I would unload my bike. I parked at this lake, me and my other buddy. And uh, I bought up a little roll-up mattress, put it in the back of my truck. I'd sleep in there and then load my bike up, go riding, train fly to the races on the weekend so not typical that's gangster yeah like, yeah you're just making shit happen. i, I could have went home to new mexico yeah. but i just felt like that was failure to me i was like okay i'm, yeah. I'm doing this yeah i'm not going back there to all that trouble i'm gonna chase my dream yeah yeah because there is like a burn the boats mentality yeah that i think you kind of have to have to make it and i knew i knew once i was all in on moto that that was my only option to do something something great i would say yeah or else i would just be live i guess a normal life which is fine right yeah but i knew i had some talent at it and i don't know but it was till later until i figured out how to use my talent if that makes sense oh man for sure and and i think um there is a like i was literally just talking to my wife about last night and it's like i struggled to chill yeah because it's like you i feel like i have potential and i feel like i have these goals and like this thing that you're working towards and it's like chilling doesn't really Mm. play into that and it's like you take some downtime and it's in the back of your mind like hey i I wish i i wish i could chill be honest with you i wish i I could shut it down i see other people that can do that i'm like but me i'm the same way and that's that was a big struggle for me when i when i retired from racing because when you're when you're towards the end of the career you know you're kind of tired of the pressure you're tired of the I yeah mean, it's it's a grind right yeah and you're looking forward to retiring you're like man it's gonna be great i'm just gonna chill I'm gonna chill and it's cool for about two weeks honestly for me like i was like all right this is cool you know i was eating what i wanted to eat drinking some beers playing some golf and then like after a while you're like, okay what next? what now yeah you know and even if you wake up and you want to go golfing or something, you, you call your butt. Everybody's working. Everyone's working, yeah. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to golf by myself. Yeah. So I went through a period of time, like, I didn't know what to do, and I was miserable. And that was when I started, you know, doing the testing gig, and, you know, that's that's kind of been what I've been doing for the last 10 years. I think it probably is something, like, when you come from a place, like, I was, I wanted to leave my town. And I, as soon as I knew how big the world was in a sense, or I think it's for me, at least it was, we, all we had was like moto movies, mountain bike DVDs, like that kind of thing that showed us the outside world. And I just, maybe it's a thing when you kind of come from a small place where you don't feel like there's the opportunity for you, like what your potential is and like who you are. I never felt like I fit that town. Yeah. And I think that maybe that like, it's almost like a little bit of anxiety to do shit. Maybe that mm-hmm. it's so conditioned from being a kid and I think that it's like, still, oh, I got to go, I got to go. I'm the same, yeah, yeah. same. Like, I, I can't chill. <laughs> even, I mean, I'll be honest, even even like my kids, they play baseball and basketball. Like baseball, it's a little slower. And yeah. I, I struggled with that at first, just sitting sitting at the games. And obviously, I, I love watching my kids play sports but they're only that. playing for like this much of the time yeah time and so like but I, i've learned to kind of learned how to chill on that in, in that environment yeah but, but I, that's I, about it other than that i'm wheels are turning I'm, I'm ready to go yeah but i mean fuck you got to do something right yeah, <laughs> yeah. like life, life is long and especially when you're in a position like you want won a bunch of championships like money is not like taking care of forever, but like yeah, you end up with a good chunk of money from 
your career. And it's like, if you're smart, you don't have to just get stuck in that grind. But yep. then it's like, there's a challenge of, well, what do you do? No, from exactly. There? You have to do something. I mean, uh, and for me, that this gig that I've been doing is, is perfect for me. You know, I still get to ride, do what I love. And I'm learning a lot on the technical side. You know, like engineering's always, you know, I've been intrigued by it always, you know, yeah. just that side of, of the sport. And uh feel like my, my brain works that way, math, you know, mathematically, I'm pretty good. Yeah. So it, it's it's been good. Yeah. So when you grew up with your brother a couple of years ahead of you, I feel like that's a very classic story. Uh, and especially that two year mm -hmm. age gap, because it's like you're not, you're, you're too young to like really be like his peer, but you yep. can kind of hang out all the time. And you're like the, you're like that tag along brother exactly. age. And it, I feel like it really ramps up your progression as a kid because you've just kind of got this benchmark always. Yeah. And, and there was other guys in town that I was the youngest guy, you know, yep. so that, as far as the racers that we all, all rode with. And there was some great, great riders that I grew up uh, riding with on the daily and, um, like my brother, he was a great rider. I mean, he he was probably more talented than I was in a lot of ways. Um, I just don't think he, for whatever reason, racing he didn't quite have the racing mind. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, when yeah, it, when yeah. It, yeah. But talent, smooth, like just he was great on the dirt bike. And other guys in town too. Just w they had a supercross track in town, so I started riding supercross on mini bikes. You know, from a young age, and I think that's why that's what helped me later later in my career is was I was great at Supercross from from the get go. Um the outdoor side I had to learn. I was I was no good at outdoors when I first started. I was, you know, twenty fifth place guy, you know, just struggling to get points and I got better as I went, moved to the East Coast for a while and, you know, learned how to ride the ruts and because growing up in New Mexico yeah, I never I never I didn't even know what a rut was. You know, <laughs> yeah. it was like desert sand or hard pack. So um that side of it I I had to learn. What was the riding program when you're a kid was it basically like wait till your dad gets home from work load up the bikes and kind of find a place to to ride for a couple of hours before dark yeah basically we didn't have tracks so yeah it was it was just out in the desert you know we had some some guys over the years you know just made tracks mainly like sand whoop tracks yeah um but me i i grew up like i grew up watching the crusty demons videos motor triple x so i was always more attracted to the just free ride, you know, go out. So that's what I would go do. My brother would be hammering motos. I'd be out carving a cliff, doing this, and my dad would be like, what are you doing? I'd be like, yeah, just doing my thing, you know? So I, I, to be honest, I almost went freestyle. You know, 97 was the first freestyle, I believe, right, in Vegas. Yeah, around then. And around that time, I had I had all the tricks. I mean, it wasn't nothing, nothing great. And I almost went to that first freestyle competition like that was like I was on the you fence like of making that. a choice. Yeah, in a way. yeah, because yeah, that was that's how I grew up. I just I free rode and did the tricks. Like I said, I I, I went and raced because that was the only outlet for dirt bikes. Right, there wasn't no freestyle. Yeah. So, like, uh, my career almost took a, a different turn. I would say. Man, imagine imagine the universe where we're sitting here and instead of being the multi time <laughs> yeah. motor, it's like I'm Tedesco freestyle, like founder yeah, of the Metal crazy, Militia right? kind that'd of crazy. Uh, like some like cartel reference, like freestyle, <laughs> freestyle dude or something. <laughs> but I grew up racing with uh, Pastrana. You know, we brought, he's about a year younger than me. So oh, okay. I had to deal with that guy my whole life. What was which, that like? Dude, I mean the dude's amazing, right? He's just super talented. Because that's the weird thing about amateur motocross. Like, there'd be guys that were like James was in their class, and it was just like he was the guy, or yeah. Ricky, or Pastrana. You, you basically didn't win, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I didn't win much as an amateur. I never won Loretta Lynn's. I won, I won motos there, uh, but can never seal the deal. Mainly because of the mud race. You know, you have that one mud, mud moto, and I sucked in the mud. Um, so I never won. I would always, I'd win a lot in like Vegas, you know, when they had the what's world it, minis, world mini, yeah, like, yeah. Th that kind of conditioned dirt. I could, I could hang with anybody in the in the country, but on that stuff, not not so much. Was there a good scene in New Mexico, racing? Yeah, just like motor motorsports in general. Mm, there was a, there was probably about 10, 10 guys that a lot of them went and raced Supercross, like yeah. the, all the the Johnson brothers, Isaiah. Oh yeah, Isaiah, Keith, and Kevin Johnson. Yeah, they're all 
two of them were brothers and cousins. And then Justin Buckley was from there. Ryan Clark's from there. Yeah. Um, and then my brother. So I was one. Of, I was me and Buckley were the young ones, and uh, we had all those guys to to learn from. Yeah. What did you ever see Anderson as a kid? No, I was already. So think, you would have been pro. I'm by probably then? about. 15 years older than so him bit, or something like that. a bit too much of Yeah, a, I was already yeah. pretty much out of town by the time he was. Yeah. But I always heard about him talking with the local guys like, oh, this kid. There, they always just said the one kid because there was a big group of us. And I used to always ask, is there any other kids coming from that area? And they, they were always talking about Jason. Yeah. It's funny that if you go back to the errors, I feel like you were very Jason Anderson-ish. I would say in, in a In a way, yeah. you know, like I, I feel like maybe there's just some kind of vibe of where you grow up. I like, think so. I feel like that's a very, that's a real thing. I would say the same for Aussies, right? Like no matter where you, it's kind of, you have that similar, I don't know what it is. I would, yeah. say, I would say, yeah, it's all where you, I mean, that first part of your, your life, that that's what, you know, carves you, right? That's makes you who you are. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, f I feel like with, with Ando, it's like, I, I mean, I, how would you even describe that New Mexico vibe? Because... I'm not sure. It's just it's. I know I know Anderson grew up on kind of the other side of the kind of in the not in the country, but not in the ghetto like where I grew up. But I, I'm not sure. Yeah, just maybe just just like if you grew up in Texas or yeah. you're gonna be a little different or yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just hard to pinpoint like what the New Mexico vibe yeah. is because there definitely is something to well, that. You, you know, have you watched Cops before? Yes. Yeah. Albuquerque is on cops a lot. Like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's just that kind of place. Was was Albuquerque in uh, Breaking Bad? Much? It was. Yeah, yeah. Was that the city that it? It was. It was. The city. It was the I, city. And I've never watched that show. Everybody asked me. Have you me never that. watched? Never it? watched it, dude. It's pretty fucking. That's what everybody says. <laughs> it, well, I think it's actually. I, th I feel like that and Game of Thrones is probably the best two. See, I've never watched that. Yeah. Never watched that. Do I'm you, not. A, I don't watch not, TV. Not a though, TV really, guy. To be honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. I watch sports. That's about it. What sports are you in aside from? Uh... I watch a lot of basketball. Okay, that's kind of my main. I would say mainstream sport that I watch. Yeah. Um, I used to watch football, but I don't know. Kind of don't really watch that anymore. But it's just hard to be. A, I feel like it's hard to be a fan of basketball because of how many games they play, and then it it's is. hard to be a fan of football because of how long the yeah. the games are. Because that's what my wife we were talking about football, uh, basketball the other day, and I'm like. I, just I love, don't know if I I love can... uh, playoff basketball. Once yeah. once the playoffs start, you know, there's usually like a game a night. Yeah, just and it means something. They play harder. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's exciting to watch. Yeah, it's a it's an insane sport in terms of like the the genetic lottery mm -hmm. that that takes place. Like, you know? I'm not making it to the NBA e ever. <laughs> like, e e there's there's so many people that love the NBA that just have zero chance of ever yeah. making it. And it, it's one of the cool things about Moto is that it seems to not have the genetics at play so in, much, yeah. in the same way. But I, I've been thinking more recently that I, I think genetics are starting to well, come into play a bit more. I would say, I mean, once you get to the top level of anything, right? Like I, I trained a lot with Dungey. Yeah. And that dude's just kind of a freak, right? Like he, he like the, they used to call him the diesel. Yeah. Like I, I could never have what say he had the way his, and it used to frustrate me, you know. So you, so he just had like insane cardio. Yeah, just insane. You just, I'd be suffering. You look over at him on. It's just. <laughs> <laughs> That's gotta be. So and, and I've shit. trained with a lot of guys, and there's guys out there that are that are better than others, you know. Just. Yeah. And you could obviously get better with with training and doing yeah. things right but um at a certain point you you have what you have right well yeah there's a ceiling for your development yeah you know like and i'm the same like my brother versus me like dude my brother can just go and just pump 30s isn't that weird and you guys come from, same thing yeah. we come from and we're like we talk we sound the same and we talk yeah. we're the same height like grew up in the same environment yeah, yeah. and just the guy has a motor really? like a crazy crate <laughs> like he could just go and do like he could go and do a national he could finish all the races like he could just he could go and do a marathon right now yeah, just, like we go for a mountain guy. bike ride my legs are burning yeah. and he just hasn't even he's just chilling yeah 
I would say my brother was similar. Like he, I always dealt with arm pump, and I don't. He's always saying, "Ah, never." <laughs> I'm like, "Dude, I wish." Because if you if you deal with arm pump, you know, like, dude, that sucks. Like, yeah. there's no way you can't ride up to your capability. And I was one of the first guys to get that arm pump surgery. I, I, I tried everything. But Did it help? No. Yeah. Okay. Not for me. And I, I remember I got it done. I was like, I got it done while while I had a hip injury, so I wasn't just down for that. And I think I. Was, about two months, you know, I did all the therapy and got it, got it all right. And first time I went to go ride, I'm like, all right, dude, no arm pump. How good? Remember, <laughs> I just went hard from the start and just exploded. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, it, diet was the biggest thing for me with with arm pump that I could, as long as I ate clean. Yeah, usually didn't show up. Yeah, you know, I cheat cheat a little bit on my diet. Usually, it would creep in. What kind of diet would work for you? Um, if I eat a lot of a lot of like gluten, yeah, um, bre- and bread. Like I just, it just makes me inflamed. Yeah, and so I, I cut all that out of my diet and just try not to eat a lot of sugar, like processed sugars and yeah. That's about it. Just, just try to eat clean. Yeah, it's fucking crazy what really sticking to a diet will do. Yeah, for sure. how much it sucks to do that, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, I had a surgery once. I had kidney surgery. And uh, I pretty much, I couldn't do anything like it. They fully cut through really? all my side. I couldn't, I was fucked. And uh, so I, I basically was just like, everyone, there was when keto was in and I was like, I'm just going to do a diet because it's kind of all I can yeah. actually, like I'm just sitting, laying on a couch, watching TV, I eating and drinking. Have something like, to focus I might, on. I might yeah. try and do this. Felt amazing. And I, I struggle with like sinuses and like phlegm and stuff like that. And it's just, as soon as I did that, yeah. fucking gone it's all that inflammation yeah yeah but then i'm like my life sucks Th- that is the one like thing that. i wish i would have known more about when i did race or maybe i sh- would have sought out more was was diet like yeah. i used to when i was younger i had like, ah, diet you know just calories in calories out right like that's just <laughs> yeah. kind of how i thought of it and I'm not saying i know a lot but i feel like I, I know a little bit more and i wish i wish i would have known more when i was younger i feel like you your era of racing though was like as we just kind of got it was you know it was very new and i'm sure there were guys that you might even know of some guys that they went all in and adopted all of the best practice like it probably seemed hokey at the time and they actually got a lot of benefits from. no for sure yeah for sure and i was that guy for a little bit like i was that guy doing come on like but yeah, you know, ten years ago, you're like, oh, man, he was right. You know, there was something there. Yeah, but I mean, it's... that's where you can't be so. I feel like closed minded. Yeah. But at the same time, you can't just let everything. Let everything. Because yeah. there's so much, so much out there. Did you have trainers and stuff? Yeah, like... I did. Yeah, I um, had a few just random guys when I was, you know, first first term pro, more just like gym trainers, meathead trainers, and yeah, that definitely didn't help me. You know, no. I, I went backwards on it, but. The first guy that really that uh, really helped me was uh, and he, he was with me for about what, six seven years was Darren Stockton. Oh yeah, yeah. So he he was my first. I was the first guy he worked with in the moto moto industry. He comes from the bicycle world like most of them do, and uh, the biggest thing he brought to me was just the structure the structure of the program day in and day out, just top to bottom. You know, he would be out there filming me. Um, Watched a lot of film of myself. I, I felt like that helped me. That's huge. Yeah. yeah, just top to bottom, just you know, did it for me. And and really, that that was the my breakout year was was oh four. That was when I started working with him at the end of oh three. And I feel like obviously that oh four season was my best season I ever had. So that was when uh, I started working with him. So when you you were fourteen and you started taking it a bit more seriously at that age, what? What was the pathway like, or what? How did you like see the vision forward of how you could actually make it a career? Mm-hmm. Well, I knew I knew Supercross was was a thing, right? I mean, yeah. I was watching McGrath, and I was like, okay, I had that Supercross track locally, so I I, I pretty much just rode that a lot, you yeah. know. And and there wasn't really an outlet for amateur Supercross, right? I mean, uh, so no one really ever got to see my skill on it. It wasn't like they're like, oh, this guy's gonna be good once it come comes. Pro, yeah, um, and there was an, a Supercross series in Colorado, like four or five races, SRAC Supercross series, in these like arenas. It was it wasn't like small arena cross, but it wasn't quite Supercross. Yeah, 
Um, so I did a lot of that style. I actually did more of that style of racing than motocross. So that really helped me once I turned professional because obviously supercross is quite a big deal. Yeah. It's kind of strange that there isn't more development in supercross. I've been thinking about it a bit recently. Like arena cross should be pretty huge. Right. It should be. Don't you think? Yeah. I learned, I learned a ton doing all that style of racing. And I didn't have that learning curve coming in as a professional. Like, like you know, a lot of these kids, like whoops, is the, the biggest thing. They, they, they can usually do the jumps. They can, they, they could corner right, but they, the whoops is like they can't figure them out. And then that learning curve, it, usually they, they get signed right. They start riding Supercross in October. They got till January to figure it <laughs> they out. They get hurt in December. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it always happens. And if if they could look ahead and and learn that craft early, I mean, it's just gonna make make life easier. And I think. Now people understand that now, and yeah, you, you know that's not quite a, as big of a deal. But yeah, but it just seems like if you were a kid racing and you wanted to do Supercross, or like you knew it's fifty, like fifty fifty, but probably more emphasis probably on more. Supercross. It's like, shouldn't there just be all of these arena cross races that you, you can would think so. go and ra- and it's like a really advertised kind of thing. Like, hey. Go do arena cross. Go race arena cross. Like, and it would only help you. For sure. But, but I think even from, like, I I kind of want to live in a world where we don't have 60 dudes trying to qualify for a night show in Supercross. Yeah. Where it's like, okay, these are the dudes that race Supercross. Everyone else races arena cross. But I also still watch arena cross. Like, imagine if, imagine if we could watch arena cross Friday night. And then Saturday night was Supercross, yeah, you know, and cool. it's like you could actually because there's some dudes that are racing arena cross that are like really good, and there's some cool talent. It's not as corporate. You could get a lot more personality. It's like it would almost be like PBR, yeah, in a, in a sense, you know. And then it's like okay, then we've got super buttoned up Supercross, like and like where can, do you even watch arena cross? Because I I would love to watch it, but I just I don't even know. I, I mean, I'm sure you can. But it's like it's because that, that style racing is fun to watch. It's it's exciting, right? Yeah, and I think it's for young people too to get into it. Like, and there's guys I'm sure that just don't want to fuck with motocross. Yeah, but you, it sounds like in your career, you almost have to grind out the outdoor side of the sport because no one can just be supercross only from day yeah. one. Not out. from day one, no. It's not going to happen, and now, and now with this the the playoffs, the SMX playoffs. I mean, it's kind of forcing you to mm. to race both, right? Yeah. How much harder was motocross for you? A lot, a lot harder. Um, Supercross came pretty easy, I think, just because of my background. I yeah. did did a lot more of it, but that gnarly rutted outdoor man, it, it that that was a struggle for me. So so for me to win an outdoor title, I mean that that was huge. That was that was definitely my biggest accomplishment of my career and if you would have asked me early on there's no way sleeping in the yeah, back of the yeah, truck yeah. <laughs> you'll win one of these yeah, one day bro. Win, just, keep, just keep no going way. to the races but i, I remember because that was the year stewart moved out of the class right he moved up and i remember racer x did a poll okay stewart's moving out of the class who's gonna win this title i mean it's pretty open right there was probably 12 guys on the list my name wasn't even on the list not, I had won two Supercross championships at this point, you know. So that 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 motivation I got from that poll w- was huge. That's so if, sick. If, if my name would have been on that poll, I might not have won that title. I'll be honest. So th- that's how much drive that gave me. Really? Yeah, I was pissed. No way. I mean, dude, that's awesome. Like, yeah. the, if you can find that level of motivation and I something felt like so that's simple. how it, it was always for me. I yeah. can find whether it was one thing one guy i could dig in and and you know what i mean yeah and that's kind of how i always was throughout my career i would always have something that would drive me to that next level you're just finding a carrot somewhere yeah yeah. i I I think you have to like when you're training that much and and you want to get the most out of yourself you 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 have to get to get that extra five percent you have to have that yeah because whether it's manufactured or not you know you 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 got to have that because all you're doing all day as an athlete in a sense is talking to yourself mm-hmm. about who you want to be what you want to do like there's this constant conversation 
taking place in your mind that is like kind of propelling you towards the thing that you're chasing and it's like you need to you need to have something in that story and it sounds like you know that pole or you know those little rivalries or those things it's like that's you know what you use to to dig in and i think that's the that's the one thing i still i do miss from Mm. racing is still just those rivalries that yeah I do miss that. <laughs> where, where where did you learn that kind of stuff? Because I always find that really interesting. As far as tr- that motive, like what? Well, yeah, the because it's there's like to be a champion. There's a certain mindset you have to have, and those conv- those internal conversation, like driving to the track. Mm-hmm. You know, on a day where you're like sore and tired, it's like is the conversation because I I go through it with my own training with jiu-jitsu right like every fucking night i go to training like you, got, you got the guy telling you ah, don't yeah you're good just chill yeah. you're sore yeah, yeah yeah there's a story like oh it's mm-hmm. tonight gonna be the night i get fucked up or oh, i beat this guy like he's gonna come at me crazy fucking up. and it's all none of it might not happen yeah but it's all this and it builds this like anxiety and then it, like there's some nights i go to train and i'm like i just i'm i suck before yeah. i even get there and then I suck as bad as I said I would suck. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm Well, that's, a, that, that's how powerful the mind is, right? Yeah. And, and so, like, where did you learn the, and those really tools know. and, and uh, what were they? I think, I think a lot of it was maybe growing up racing against my brother. He was good. And he, I mean, he just used to kick my ass. I mean, he was on the daily. Just, I think that's probably where it started, you know. And I'm not sure. Just personality, I think, yeah. is the biggest thing. Just who I am as a person. It's just always been there. Do you remember like what what would be the kind of like motivational talk you'd give yourself on the way to the track or on the way to a race or like in the in a plane? Where, because it's like when you're a you're like you have to be obsessed, and when you're obsessed about something, it's all you think about. No, oh, yeah. So it's like, what were you thinking about that does lead to those results? You know, man, I don't I don't even know. That's a that's a good question. I think. I just would run through the scenario in my head so many times. Mm. I've, I've one of those guys. I'd just sit there and so yeah. it's like visualization. Yeah, I, I was a big visualizer. You know, I would visualize things a lot. And what like gate drop, hole shot, lines, everything. Yeah, and visualizing it how you would want it to. You know, not say want it to go how you how it's gonna go. You yeah. Know, you, you, and it didn't always work out how that way, right? <laughs> well, I, yeah, so that was going to be my next question. Was there ever a time where you visualized something like super detailed and it just went the exact way that you visualized it? Yeah, I mean, it's, I'd say like on a, a whole shot or something like that. You know, you because I used to do that, you know, you visualize it and you, you end up timing it, right? Mm. Like I got a picture of myself, Bud's Creek, I think it's in twelve. And I got like one of those like three bike lengths. <laughs> that was one of those ones. Like I just went, you know, like Sexton at uh, yeah, you know, like yeah. you yeah. just you just have that feel. Just felt yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that has to be a pretty crazy feeling. Oh, when you're when you're three bike lengths looking around, yeah, it's cool. There's no one there. But that I ended up eat, eating it like half a lap in, um, lacerated my liver, big one. Really? Yeah. Is that buds? So that, that was that year I filled in for Mitch. Um, I've dropped back down to the two fifty class. Um, oh, I was a super cross was that, only. Was it twelve? Twelve. I remember that because so, I was here actually. Yeah, so I, I think a lot of their, his guys got hurt. I was super cross only riding for Hart and Huntington. Hart and Huntington, right? Yeah. So me and Mitch started talking. I went and rode the bike one day. I'm like, dude, let's do it. That'd be cool. Dude, I was having so much fun on that thing, and I got fourth at the first round. Um, which wasn't bad. Like, then I I tweaked my knee at the at freestyle in the second round. I mean, I spun my leg around. I uh-huh. caught caught a hay bale around a fast sweeper, and it s- spun my leg around, tore my MCL. And I I tried to keep it going, but it's just once you're hurt, it's it's tough. Yeah. But I came back, like I said later in the year at Buds, whole shot that moto, ate it, <laughs> lacerated my liver. I didn't even know though. I was I was there by myself. Um, and I drove back to D.C. I flew, I flew into D.C. So I get back to the hotel by myself, check in. And I go take a piss, and it's just blood. Oh. And I'm like, oh, shit. And I'm like, ah, oh, let me just drink a water. 
I pounded it water. <laughs> See if it clears yeah, that's, out. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. move. Yeah. It definitely didn't clear out. So I'm like, shit. So I drove myself to the hospital. They checked me out. Yeah, you got a lacerated. Uh, actually, it was a kidney. Yeah. Yeah, lacerated kidney. What's the What's yeah. the uh, protocol for that? Uh, so they just they kept me for I think two or three days in the in the oh. hospital, made sure everything went okay, and then. But I I checked myself into one hospital, and then they're like, oh, they didn't realize how bad it was. They took me to another hospital. So then by the time I was done, I had to get a taxi. To, from the one hospital to the other hospital, get my rental car, and then get my rental car, fly home. <laughs> <laughs> the joys. Right? Just in the hospital by myself for three days. But and just contemplating every decision. Oh, yeah. Just like, every fuck. time. It, 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 and this was when I was older. I, I had one kid at home. You know, my wife is at home. Obviously, she's called, like, should I go there? She, and I'm like, no. Don't even worry about it. I'm, I'll be all right. <laughs> Dude, that's like the, the journeyman like motocross rider in a sense too you know because there's like there's these two there's two ways to do it there's three ways to do it you never become anybody and you retire you become the baddest dude going and you win a bunch of championships and you retire on top or you become the baddest dude and then you go you know what i just fucking like riding dirt bikes and then you just stay in it and you stay in it and you stay and you're not you know you're not going to win anymore you know you're not going to win another championship but it's a fucking good job yeah. And you want to keep doing it. And it's like you were one of those guys. Like you you probably could have not necessarily like retired on top, but it's like you could have retired way earlier, full factory dude, getting majority third, fourth, you know, and then going like, sweet, what a good career. But you were one of the guys that was, I'm assuming you just went like, I just fucking like this. Yeah. And, and be honest, I, I thought I could still be a third yeah. third place guy it just yeah. wasn't it just wasn't quite there like maybe that was me just not seeing it i, I, I don't really know um and those 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 last few years I, they, they weren't fun mm. you know after being you know winning races being getting seventh eighth ninth that that's not fun and that that was when i was like finally because my last race at buds um when i finally retired like well you almost died yeah, right you had I like did. was it heat exhaustion yeah fuck so i remember that going up to the second moto i was you know just not feeling great it was uh it was hot that day just buds it's just what humid. year was it that was uh 14 14 so I, re- I remember like four laps to go i just was feeling it just dude you're not feeling good but uh somebody was catching me and, and i'm i remember just thinking that that, that ain't happening you know? <laughs> yeah my my ego basically almost killed me is what what happened and i i I was just—I didn't even hardly know what I was doing that last lap. I've crashed in one of those uh, off cambers in the back, and uh, I couldn't—I couldn't get my bike to start. So I'm sitting there kicking it, kicking it, and I remember thinking of that—the guy that passed away. Josh right? Lichtel. Yeah, yeah, I think same situation. He was trying yeah. to start his bike. I pulled my helmet off because I'm overheating. I finally get it to start. So you've been to Buds, right? So, I was there that year. I'm pretty sure. So it was crazy hot to get back to the the pits. You you have to finish the lap. It's all fenced in the track. So I'm I had enough thought. Okay, I, I got to get to the the pits to get to some cold water. So I finished that half lap, no helmet, wide open, and you know j- <laughs> jumping all the jumps. Uh, so I get back to the truck and I'm getting instantly in an ice bath just so I don't die. Um, AMA comes over, freaking out on me. What what were you doing? I'm like, dude, I retired. Do whatever you're gonna do. I yeah, far me, bro. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm done. Yeah. But yeah, I, I got my heart rate up to two sixteen. Like, I was I was close. I was I felt I, it was bad. Man, I was there that year, and I remember I remember having a talk to myself in the truck because I was with JDR at the time, and uh, and I watched the both second motos inside the truck. Yeah. And I was having to talk to myself like, bro, 12-year-old <laughs> you would, would hate you right now. Get back out there. It was hot. And I was like, dude, it's too fucking hot. Mm-hmm. I don't care. Like, I don't want this bad enough. And I remember thinking like, how are these guys doing this? Yeah. They got me. I never did well. In the, I sweat really bad. I sweat a lot. Yeah. And so in those conditions, I just deplete myself. And I yeah. think in between motos, I just couldn't get enough in. And yeah. I should have just pulled off though. It's, but that's what's crazy is that you'll push yourself to that that limit over, what was I, ninth place? I don't even know what place I was in. But that's 
part of what's so amazing about the sport, you know, is mm. that, and I think it's why even just write, like you love writing now, you know? I think like, that's what a lot of people don't understand is every guy out there is pushing that hard, right? 20 second, like those guys are going as hard as they possibly can. You know what I mean? Yeah, and for them too, you know, like everyone's got their own, everyone's got their own motivation. Mm -hmm. Everyone's got their own visualization. Like a, a win to a guy like Jeff Walker, yeah. you know, is getting good points and being there, qualifying straight through nowhere else. Like everyone's got their own wins yeah. and it might not necessarily be the win and that's what of keeps the race. driving you is meeting those goals and right yeah and, it, and it's like you can just you can just black out in a moto yeah and just fucking send it <laughs> and it's like there's there's something there for you in a you know what mm -hmm. i mean like there's some kind of fulfillment by doing that in a sense yeah which is kind of it's crazy that sport we chose right it's it's not easy dude it's wild to me like looking through my wife's eyes, like, cause she just had no, she never, mo like, didn't even know what any of it was. And like, I did world vets no, this year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, I was training, I was living in Dubai doing these motos in fucking Fort, like, well, I guess it'd be like 110 degrees, massive sand track. And I'm just like sweaty and I'm <laughs> like, suck so bad. And I'm like going on all these runs. And then we, we get here and it's just like, this effort that goes into me being like a 20th place dude, yeah. that world, but dude world those vets. uh those vet nationals are they're as intense as maybe even more so in, in a certain way i don't know what it is but i i, I did a few i, I did uh the one at Glen Helen in a couple of years and mammoth one year and then i, I did the farley castle oh vet, yeah yeah vet yeah. designations a couple yeah. years yeah and I thought that was going to be kind of a fun chill, get the old guys together, <laughs> old bikes. But I quickly realized when I showed up, like, this is for real. You know, like, <laughs> they're the here. Is serious. Yeah. So, man, that it was that was a crazy race because I've never rode a, you know, twin shock old. What 80s. What did you end up riding that year? The first time I rode a KX five hundred in the Evo class, and yeah. then I think it was like an eighty one Husky. 500 or something i can't even remember but the brakes don't work on those things no and, and that's realized. all hills that track yeah and there's that steep downhill and the first first lap i drop in because i rode the 500 first so i knew the track and i drop in like about the normal speed i did before and i'm like dude there's nothing there i ended up in the trees no way oh, yeah. just fully just, like through. i couldn't stop just fully in the trees <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that once you get on the line and you but mad respect for those guys that race those bikes like Different era, different, like, you had to be tough to ride those things. Man, have you ever seen footage of Jean-Michel Bale at, like, Motocross of Nations Unreal. and shit back right. in the day? It's just, like, there's one video of him, 92 Motocross of Nations at Manjimup in Australia. Like, I've raced that track. It's insane. It's just half sand, half decomposed granite, like, pea, well, they call it pea gravel. It's, like, literally little marbles, right? Mm -hmm. And he's just riding a... 500 he literally looks like jet lawrence yeah on a cr 500 he, that dude was then. amazing not uh, not too many dudes could ride a 500 to its full potential right i mean even these days i would say like just that took a special special gift for sure and you think about some of the guys that did race those bikes like jeff ward yeah tiny dude yeah. you know what i mean and he was just a hand just hammer sending it and then you get like uh jeff leask do you, do you remember jeff? i remember the name yeah. yeah so he's an aussie guy they call him flying freckle little redhead so he's the same thing yeah yeah, yeah just say so anyone what, what is it with the redheads well you know what's crazy dude so before the villo pod i was just doing some like random research and uh and there's like an actual thing with redheads where there's some like mutation in the DNA that makes them not feel pain, really, in the same way, yeah. Huh. And then Second stuff. Maybe I've been with Ricky, you know, whether, whether it's cycling, whatever he do can suffer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a thing, man. And so they reckon that redheads take more anesthetic in surgeries too. Really. So that's there's there's mm. literally some biology going on because there is a crazy outsized difference of redheads because they only make up two percent of the population yeah but they've probably got 80 percent of the motocross <laughs> like when that's you crazy huh? like it can, can it be a coincidence yeah. you know 
Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> but when you did train with, with Ricky, could you really see in like, is it crazy obvious this dude's a freak? This dude's just fully built different. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and, and a lot of it's his, the mentality. I, I'd say just, I don't know. Like, I, I, I remember Millville 07, when he already did part-time. Yeah. He came and waxed everybody. Millville went 1-1. Remember, I can't remember what moto it was, but he came in. He won by 30 seconds. He was pissed. This thing, piece of shit. This thing sucks. And I'm just sitting, I think I, I got fourth. Fifth, I don't even know what I got. And I'm sitting there like, dude, what? <laughs> You're that mad? You just won the moto by 30 seconds. <laughs> but he, that, that, that explained, like, he's just a special. Like, he, yeah. I don't know. Just dark. Yeah. Just, the, the, there's got to be some, like, deep dark shit going on to where it's but you just play, like so obsessed you play racquetball because we that was one sport we used to play dude so competitive mm. like <laughs> he's just gnarly yeah yeah just once i never beat him i though, to this day like couldn't i get so close but he would somehow edge me out i don't know and you wonder like is it just some like jedi mind trick that they've got to where yeah. but even i'd i'd say that being around um because I was doing the film and stuff back in the day. I remember I went to the farm once to film a commercial for the RMZ and he was a he wasn't right. I think he'd had some something happen. He wasn't he wasn't riding. And but just like the level of shit talk. I can't remember who did oh, the yeah. actual I can't remember who was the rider. It was like a privateer dude at the time and they made him basically like look like Ricky. Oh, okay. And but he, he was, was out there. <laughs> and he was out there. <laughs> I don't fucking look like that when I ride. Like, you're, you look yeah. like shit. <laughs> and he was like, give me the helmet. And he like, don't hold back, does he? No. Nah. But there's uh, that type of guy. It's like dig, dig. He'll just dig at you, oh, yeah. dig at you, dig at you. I think a lot of that comes from his mom though. Mm. Like how, because... I was there two, what, two years, and, she, you know, she was out there every day grinding, grinding it out. She's gnarly, straight up, like, you could, you can't explain it, really. Yeah. Yeah. But she, and she says it with a smile on her face, you know, so it's not like she's angry, screaming at you, she'll just, all right, if, if that's good enough for you, if you, <laughs> if seventh place is good enough for you, then we, we go back. If you yeah. want to quit, we can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, just the way she would say it, and it, dude. You'd just be out there for hours trying to fulfill whatever that was that she, like, yeah. lap time. Yeah. Because that was the program, right? Like, I remember Townley telling me you do motos and then it was sections. Mm -hmm. And then you'd do your, you'd have to, like, when you were fresh, you'd have to do, like, a, a heat as fast as you can go on that section. And then you had to hit, like, 10 laps in a row or 10 sections in a row like mm -hmm. at that time and you couldn't leave until you did like yeah, yeah. crazy shit was that actually what it was like yeah or or you before a 40 minute moto you'd um uh, on your warm-up you would get say your, your your fastest lap time you'd have to lay some lap times down you had to in your moto you you had to open with that and you had you couldn't drop below that or else you're getting pulled off and starting your moto over again and there was times I, i'd get four laps in no, no, no. Come over. You might get to wipe your goggles off. All right, we're starting again. No. And there, there, this is multiple times. I, there was time I'd be out there for an hour. And, and I remember Ricky, when he was he was already retired, there was times he had to come and say, hey, dude, that that's you can't. That's enough. Like, he's he smoked. Look at him. <laughs> <laughs> just messy. And she wasn't having none of it. You know, just she would be there with her arms crossed. Like, and most of the time I would have to do it. <laughs> how hard is it to drive to the like how hard were some of those drives to that farm oh man so and there was some days she wouldn't show up and <laughs> there was days i would be out there on my warm-up and i thought she wasn't there and i would see her suburban pull up i'm like oh, god it's gonna be one of those days i thought i was gonna have an easy day <laughs> mm. i bet it was crazy hard to drive to the track some days yeah. knowing what you're in for and i'm all about hard i'm i'm all about it but when you're that smoked, there's a, and there's a limit to it, right? Yeah. Guy to guy, where you're at at that moment too, right? Like if you have the base to handle it, if you haven't had injury, you know, there's a lot yeah. that goes into the thought and from my perspective of you got to meet a guy where he's at. Yeah. And you could push him, but you can't just 
ah, this is what you got to do. Yeah, you can't yeah. ask for what someone doesn't have in a sense. Yeah. And they might get there. It might take them six months, but I don't know. You got to – that's where I, I wasn't quite ready for for mm. that. And it didn't work for me, you know, yeah. when, I, when I was there. I didn't get better while I was there. If anything, maybe a little worse. I don't know. Did you – were you there when Ricky was riding? So, no. So, we were teammates – no six, yeah. No seven, or oh seven. He was part time. Yeah. Um. I I bought my I bought a place in oh six. I bought a place in Texas. I bought fifty acres, built the whole facility. Oh, um, I didn't know. That. Yeah. So I, I I did my own deal for had it for two years. So I, I you know I bought that place for for most part most of the time my time at Suzuki that's where I was at. Uh, I had a place in Texas. I had two Supercross tracks, an outdoor track. And I I just got to where I was tired of running, running a, a track. Yeah, it, it started raining a lot, and I was missing days. And I had a bad day out there. I was trying to get the track ready. I couldn't <laughs> ride, and, and I called Ricky up, and I'm like, "Dude, I, I'm gonna sell this place. Can I can I just rent your place?" Because he was retired, and he was like, "Yeah, let me check with with Townley, make sure it'd be good." Because Townley was riding there, and yeah, he's like, "Yeah, that'd be good. We can we could train together." And so I sold that place. I, I put it on the market the next day. And luckily that happened because that was right before the recession hit. Mm. If I wouldn't have had that bad day and said, I screwed, I'm selling this place, I, I would I would have lost a lot of money. Yeah, how much would, was a place like that worth back then? Um, I think I bought that place for like 700 something like that. Okay. And then obviously whatever you dump into it, yeah. with, I mean, it's yeah, just, they're, they're en- it's just en- endless, right? <laughs> yeah. So I was, I was lucky to walk away on that one cuz I could have lost lost a lot of money but anyway I I moved to to Tallahassee um and then I split my time I, I always kept my house out here in California and just split my time What was it like riding with BT? He's a he's a good mate of mine. I I It was good. It, I feel like while we were there he he was going through that phase of just injury after injury. Mm. So man I I felt bad for the guy. You know, he he obviously had all that success on the 250 with Mitch and then he signed with uh, Honda, so we were we were at Honda together, and man, he just kept getting injured, injured, and never really got to show what he can do. I, you know, from my opinion. Oh man, I was at the race in Australia when he broke his hip, and that was kind of like the nail in the coffin, yeah. I think, for his career. But he was he was on a Carlton Dry Honda in Australia, like so the factory Honda ride, and then he got the call up for two two. That was a year I think Chad got hurt. I can't remember where he got hurt, but man, BT was fucking moving. Like he was when he's healthy and he's he's special for sure. He won this moto at Conondale, which is like our Unadilla, by a minute. Yeah, and it and like Jay Marmont, you know, like I can't remember who else was in the in the race, but like good dudes in Oz, you know, at like a minute, bro, and just I learned I learned a lot from that guy. The I mean. We were there, what, maybe two years together. He was hurt a lot. But, like, the times we were training together out there, dude, he's – I learned a lot from him on outdoors especially. In in what respect? Just riding Technique. technical? Yeah. yeah. I, all those guys that came from the Euro background, I, I learned a lot. And I think that was one of the reasons I got better at outdoors was just watching all those guys being exposed to that and just kind of being a sponge and, you know, because I knew I wasn't that good at all that. I had to, to figure it out. Yeah, and but so like, what specifically was hard? Like, is it just the dealing with like how you know long, deep ruts and like the momentum you had to carry? Was it like lean angle? Was it? I think for me, it's I'm so used to just sliding the bike mm. at all times, and when you're when you're slotted in a rut from this corner to that corner, you know, when you're just it was so foreign to me. Like the way I go fast would be sliding the bike deep, yep. deep in the throttle. And being able, like taking a step back and going slower to go faster, that was so foreign to me. Because yeah. on on hard pat, you could just ride kind of like an idiot, right? You just that you don't have to be in a certain part of the track. You know, you could just kind of wing it. You're like speed around yeah, the joint, basically. Exactly. Yeah. What What about like the the speeds themselves? Like, did you ever have trouble with like the higher speed stuff? Because Supercross is not mm. fast in a way. No, not I wouldn't say that it was the speed. It was more the the condition of the dirt. Yeah. Ruts, softer, like or even I wasn't bad in sand because you're not 
as like slotted in, if that it's, makes sense. Like, yeah, like yeah. When You're I was moving and sliding yeah, a lot in stance. So. That was just so foreign to me. So that's when I, I moved to, I didn't move. I, I spent, I bought a bus, you know, for the outdoors. I spent the whole summer in a, in a bus and just traveled the circuit. That, that was <clears throat> how I learned how to ride that stuff. Uh, bought a bus, put a van on the back. That's when I rode for Mitch. Yeah. Threw bikes in the back of the, the van. And I just, whatever race was before, like Southwick, I went to Red Sand before Red, you know, just kind of traveled. I never jumped on an airplane the whole, the whole year. Dude, that's sick. It, it was, it was that super fun. That would be a fun. fun year. Yeah, no airplane rides, you know, rode different conditions. would go stay at this buddy's, you know, park at this buddy's house. We'd go ride kind of just wherever, wherever the circuit was going. That's one of the, I feel like the underrated aspects of being a pro motocross rider is like your life becomes pretty simple. You just, what do I need to do today to get better? If you've got, if you're making good money and you've got good support and then you go like, okay, this is what I think I need. I need a bus. I need a van. Yeah. I need to spend it. And then you just lock in and a year goes by pretty quick oh, yeah. and it's fucking cool. Dude, that was, those were fun years. Those two years. Yeah. Got to see, see the, the whole country. Cause usually you just fly into a, yeah. you fly and fly out. So it was, it was super cool. Like. And it obviously helped me learn how to ride that stuff. I ended up, you know, winning that second year I did that, I ended up winning the outdoor title. Yeah. You can see. And I think if I would have just stayed in California and did the, t I don't think I would have won that outdoor title that year. Yeah. Or it would have been harder for me to do, I would say. It's such a specific riding condition here. You know, I mean, I love Glen Hill and that's like my favorite track out here, but it, that's very just slide, you know. And even, even times I spent, say, two, two months in Florida. And then I would come back out here to test. I, it would be foreign for me for, you know, first session. It's just it, the dirt's so different, right? Mm. Yeah, I mean, dude, that's the thing I struggled with. Like I learned, I learned at Glen Helen, you know, it just gets that line around it. Mm -hmm. The whole track just has that line. And the secret to going fast at that track is just spin your rear tire the mm -hmm. entire way yeah. and follow that line and if like you, is that foreign to you oh bro because yeah. i grew where i grew up is just knee deep ruts everywhere okay so you're yeah. complete opposite yeah of, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so like everything that you're saying like i can relate to in the, the opposite exact yeah. opposite <laughs> way you know like as soon as you get the big big deep ruts and like that soft kind of dirt that's that's, that's where, what we grew up on you know like uh most impressive dude I ever watched in that stuff was Everts at Matterly Basin yep. 06. Yep. I mean, because it rained. <clears throat> rained Saturday night, and it was it was just rutted. Dude just looks easy for him. He was a freak, dude. Mm -hmm. He was such a special, special guy. Yeah, and everybody always told me about him before I went over. Um, first time I saw him was 05, the year before that, in Erne. Yeah. Everybody told me about him. I wasn't that impressed with him there. He was okay. Like, but that next year, when the condition was like that, dude, unreal. Like nobody passes Stewart around the outside. Standing up. Standing like this, this doesn't happen, right? <laughs> That's so iconic, guy. Yeah. And and it, when you watch it, it's not like it's spectacular, like watching James ride. Yeah. Rick or I don't even know who you'd say, but it pretty calm, right? It's not a spectacular thing to watch. It's just you, you do a lap time on him, and then you're like, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But he was in, he did races where he would race the 125 class, the 250 class, and the 500 class in a day. Yeah. Win a at a, at, a, at an, a world championship race. Yeah. Like those dudes are just fully, fully built different. Yeah. That dude was special for sure. I loved that Motocross Nations era too with you because. Mm -hmm. You were, like you said, you struggle with the outdoors. You're like this super cross guy. And you just, you. Uh, how many times did you race it? Three times, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I was going to say, I feel like for three or four years, you just found yourself yeah. on the motocross. Probably shouldn't nations. have been there. <laughs> Maybe one, at least one of them, I shouldn't have been there. When uh, when I filled in, actually at Mer Matterly, and I filled in for, for Ricky. Because I, I got hurt. I got hurt at Vegas Supercross. I tore my labrum in my shoulder. So I got surgery. I didn't ride outdoors that year. Um, I was actually at Glen Helen watching when, when Ricky crashed and hurt his shoulder. Uh. So tell that story. So I didn't ride outdoors. Uh, I, was, I went to the last race. I was like, I don't want to go to Glen Helen, but they made me go. So I, I ended up at the Fox thing up, up at top having a few beers. Shouldn't have been, but that's what I was doing. <laughs> 
so Ricky ends up crashing. So I go, you know, and I go back to the to Suzuki truck afterwards, and Roger pulls me aside, and he's like, "Hey, you think you could race Des Nations in two weeks?" Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and, I, and I'll be honest, I had a little, I had a few beers, and I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, I get, yeah, let's do it," you know. So on the way home, I'm thinking, "Dude, what did I just get myself into?" <laughs> so I, I went, and uh, the next day, I called, I called Darren up, my trainer, I'm like, "Hey." I, <laughs> let's get ready we're going you know and i i tried to ride i went i remember i went and rode at elsinore and this was after the outdoors series no one's prepping else it was like riding in the parking lot and i'm trying to think of racing designations right like I, I drove home like dude what am i doing so anyway i got to ride for like a week and a half i flew over there and uh they had a test set up that thursday um steward and villapoto and myself and I ended up oversleeping it. I, I was, you know, just overslept. So by the time I show up to the track, everybody else was done riding. But they stuck around to to watch me ride. And oh, it you was this felt. it was this rocky, shitty track, shitty ass track. So I go out there and I, I felt like a novice, I'll be honest. And I could just see everybody's face. You know, <laughs> I, I could read people's energy. I feel pretty well. <laughs> yeah. And everybody was just thinking, What is, what are we doing? Why is it here? Yeah. So I left that that day like man this is gonna be and then it rained on saturday night you know me i'm not a mud guy so my first moto uh i raced mx3 so my first moto was the second moto and i i whole shot from the outside (laughs) (laughs) i led the thing for 20 i think 20 minutes that's so wild yeah arm pump i mean i I could handle i couldn't even hold on but i ended up crashing i think the last lap and ended up getting sixth or something but enough for us to pull off the chamberlain trophy so how insane is that that was that was a tough weekend to get thrown i mean because anybody that's been to designations knows that especially for us you know you're expected to win to be able to pull it off it was that was pretty cool and with two freaks yeah as well like what a crazy team to be a part of yeah no, that was a that was a cool weekend. All all the designations experiences those those are my best, most memorable I would say experiences for sure. And so, what other ones did you do? So I did the year before that uh, in Ernay, France, on, yeah. in 05. Yeah. Um, and then oh oh nine uh, in Italy. Yeah. With Dungy and Weimer. Yeah. The B t- the B team. The B team. That's right. And so you so for us to pull one. that. Yeah. I mean, so. Three for three for me on designations. <laughs> Can't complain. That's insane, dude. That's such a crazy stat, you know. And that the Italy one, man, it came down to that final moto. Me and Dungy, I mean, uh, Oz was in it, I think, but and I think Italy was still in it. What but, year was that? Oh nine. Nine. So who was on that team for us? It would have been Chad, Reed, Medi, and Burner, maybe. Maybe. Maybe either him or McFarlane. One of the two. But I know they were still in it mathematically. Italy was maybe leading it. I can't remember. France, like everybody, we we weren't. We had to do our job basically. Yeah. And I gave Dungy the premier gate spot. Um, I think he whole shot. I was in the top four or five. And Philip Hartz, that first first, uh, mm. he just cleans me, t bones me. So I go back. I don't know twenty something place. So I just start hammering, you know, and. I, I, it's full sketch mode, <laughs> but I catch up. I, I don't know what I got that moto seventh, that eighth, whatever. But I, I didn't know we were, we were. I didn't know we won until we went by the mechanics area. You know, there was two corners to go. I saw everybody cheering. And after the race, I'm like, you, "Why didn't you guys tell me we were in position to win?" Because I had like some I sketchy moments. It. Like the yeah. last lap, I had some sketchy moments. Like, <laughs> but we pulled it, man. That was that was pretty cool to pull that off. You know, no one expected us to. No, I don't think no one did. No. And you were in, again, it's like you've got the whole Carmichael, Stewart. Once the US decided we want back in and we want to start winning these things again, it was just like this precedence of just domination yeah. and it was so expected. And America shouldn't win motocross nations, you know. For why? Half, why sh- I mean, yeah. For half the years, I know. I, don't I, know do I it. thought the same way. I mean, but, maybe that was. Maybe that's good. Like you, you're there. You're okay. Screw it. We're we're here to win. Yeah. These guys can't beat us. You know. But 
in, in reality, reality you look at it like dude maybe we shouldn't like <laughs> those guys are those guys are good and it's weird that i guess it just shows how good you guys were at that time too you know to overcome the challenges because yeah. i mean dude you go to a gp it's so different it is different and it's so gnarly dude like the way that those tracks develop they don't prep them there's all these different classes like we just they see do it. not touch the track no i remember italy uh because they do the saturday qualifying all that right yep. and I remember they were like okay sunday morning we're gonna do a team track walk we we're walking the tra- they, they didn't even touch it they just filled the ruts up with water just just <laughs> And I, I'm freaking out because that's so not my condition. Just, yeah. Dude, gnarly. Yeah. I feel like they should, I mean, they can't do that here because it's not two days, but I feel like if the tracks got rougher here, it'd be better. Mm. Yeah, I think. That, I mean, there's a limit to it safety-wise and all that, but. Yeah. Yeah, I think you definitely see a huge separation, though, between the two worlds now. You know, and like, but you have a guy like Jeffrey, he says all he wants to come and do here is race is because the tracks are fun and it's not as... The rough. other thing I, I, I like over there is they, like if, if it's a hard pack track, it's a hard pack track, yeah. right? They don't try to turn it into a sand track. Like, I feel like over here, they try to make everything... Everything's good. the same. Just, I mean, I get it, disc it up, make it, but I don't know. That's my opinion. No, no, I'm, I'm honestly with you. Like, I think that... I my hobby horse I was riding around last year was just like fuck the paddle tires, like let's get yeah. rid of the scoops, unless it's Southwick or maybe Redbud. Like why what? can't we have a con? Like, uh, why can't we say hey this weekend you can use this, this weekend you can use this. Yeah, just simple. And the hard pack tracks that they try to turn into sand tracks that that it just sits on top and right it doesn't ever. Yeah. I don't know. Well, look at Parla. Like Parla to me, the last couple years. Because they rip the starts super deep, and then they rip like the track is ripped deep for the for the no, it early is. motos, right? But it's like that's not the conditions. It's a it's a pretty hard pack no, it track, is. and then you get the the scoops going, and then you just have these like crazy ruts that everyone's in. Sexton and Jet, all Jet had to do was ride the inside lines, and you're not getting no. you're not getting past because no. you can't go outside the main line and there's no room to send it like you said when you were in those long deep ruts you have to like slow down to go fast well that's not conducive to passing a guy who's riding that one inside line plus i I just feel like visually watching it as a sport it when it's when it is that slotted like you can't see that on tv just looks like the guys are going slow right Mm. like I, i like that more fast pace where guys can use the whole track yeah inside outside I don't know, it makes for better racing in my opinion. No, I completely agree. And I'd yeah, but I just wonder like who's making that call. You know, is I'm it not just sure, yeah. Is it just the like, I think some of the things, especially on the internet, you like talk about shit and then everyone's like, Well, it's the AMA and it's like, <laughs> Okay, let's just fucking settle down. It's yeah, probably one wonder, dude that thinks he's doing a real good job. I wonder if it's up to the track itself. I, I really don't know that. But it would be cool, like to like a Bud's Creek. Like those early 2000s like late 90s races are just you know like guys just crossing lines and it's just that stuff's kind of gone a little bit these days like it made for great racing back then for sure i I don't know how that would translate to these 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 days with these bikes maybe you get going too fast i don't know but yeah what what did you think of europe in general like as an american when you traveled to europe like the food the culture the languages like c- coming from the ghetto of new the, mexico right yeah you know what I mean? the, the food's great um i think a lot better than here in a lot of ways uh, i don't know some places that i've gone were great the people were great others not so much you know like <laughs> every time i went to france I, I didn't feel like people were too into i don't know they weren't too, it's too kind. Vibe. Yeah, they weren't too kind. But everywhere else I've gone, it's been great. Yeah, it's been cool to see different cultures. Like you say, going from the ghetto of Albuquerque to to seeing the world racing a dirt bike has been, been pretty cool. Did you have the perspective when you were racing how cool it was? Or was it until you retired that you went, holy shit, yeah. that was crazy? No, I didn't. When I was in it, you're just so in that in the zone you're so focused right yeah i didn't didn't really i wouldn't say i didn't get to enjoy it like that but you you're so focused yeah 
you fly in, fly out, right? And during the week, you're it's just just a grind, right? You don't ever have no time to reflect, I don't feel. Yeah, and it's like it just sort of doesn't serve a purpose. I feel like that's just a very common thing, yeah. you know, and like I'm, I feel like in my daily life I'm trying to do the same, but I mean – I'll go to bed at night and I'll be like, what the fuck did I eat for lunch? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's yeah. like, how did I, how, how have I managed to forget yeah. what I ate for lunch five? Like, I was obviously sitting there. Yeah, you have there, to sit there and think about it. Yeah, yeah. and I was sitting there eating my food and like just not even there. It's yeah. like, I actually had a great lunch, <laughs> great <laughs> lunch, you know. But that's like most of your life. You just. But so, those are, those are usually the good days where you're not stressed, right? You're just. Just doing. Going and doing your day. Yeah. yeah. So. When you, you, you did the, the privateer Honda thing and you were making the progress, what was like, what would you say is your first big break to where you thought like, okay, I'm fully, Um, I'm fully on the right track. I would probably say my first podium at Salt Lake Supercross was like, what bike were you on there? That Plano Honda. You were on that. Yeah. Yeah. And that bike was, it was okay. But what year Honda was that? That was a. 2001 okay so it was okay yeah yeah, yeah it, ju- it was just okay yeah and, and mitch did the motors they put that old cylinder on i forget what okay. year it was 90 it would have been a 98 probably something like that yeah yeah because yeah. my brother didn't get the good cylinder he had the and, and his bike sucked <laughs> i'll be <laughs> honest compared to mine um but yeah that was kind of a breakout ride for me you know to get get on the on the box and um yeah, that next weekend, I remember at Vegas, I, because I, I was like, oh, I just got on the box, you know, I got my tr- truck lifted. I figured it out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Didn't even make the main the next weekend. Just <laughs> crashed and, yeah. <laughs> who, so I thought I had it figured out. Who was on the podium with you at that first one? Ernesto and, uh, Ernesto Fonseca and Buckaloo, I believe. Okay. I think Langston was in third and then he crashed. We were battling, he crashed. Yeah. You're like, cheers, bros. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy to think. Was that 23 years ago? Yeah. It fucking goes quick, eh? It does. And so then next year, what what ended, what, what ends up happening? So I, I caught caught the eye of Eric Kehoe. He was running Yamaha Troy. Yeah. So I signed a two-year deal with them. Um, oh, then the following year, I rode West Coast again. Was was kind of slated to win. You know, that was a year, but that was a year Stewart came in. Yeah. Um, Preston ended up winning the title. I think I got third. Um, didn't win any races that year. Um, I don't know. Just couldn't quite figure it out how to. I mean, Stewart was obviously amazing. Preston was amazing that year, and I was kind of that third place guy. Yeah. But that following year, I was kind of okay. This is the time to win, right? You got in third. You're you're close. But man, I think I just tried too hard. Just yeah. I I crashed so many times that year. I rode a. Uh, ended up riding the East Coast that year. I won the final. Final East Coast round in Pontiac. Finally yeah. got my first race win. And um, I don't know, that kind of carried me some momentum into the following year when I finally won the title for Mitch in 04. Yeah. The, what was the Yamaha Troy kind of era like? Because, were you, so were you, did you ride the 125 and then go 250 like in the two years at Yamaha or Troy or were you on the 250F the entire time? I was a 125 the whole time. Uh, so they ran one and one. Okay. And I was, I was anti four stroke. Yeah, I'll be honest. Like at the beginning, just I don't know. I was this two-stroke guy. Um, so I signed there, knowing I was going to ride a two-stroke. Rode it the whole time, and even after that, when I signed with Mitch, um, I was I was signing thinking two-stroke. First month that you know October, the whole month of October, I rode a two-stroke. But that was the year they passed the 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 fuel rule, no, no leaded fuel. I had to go to unleaded, and that killed the two-stroke. Ah. And we tried and tried to get it, and we couldn't get it. Really? It. So I tried the four stroke out, and I was like, ah. But, and we did a couple tests back and forth, did lap times, like try to figure out, okay, what's, what's the best for racing? And we ended up, you know, making the decision, let's go four stroke, which was the right call, obviously. And that thing progressed a lot from that point until we went racing and had some success on it. So when you were racing James, like, what was that experience like? Because I can imagine that was probably real annoying. Demor- demoralizing, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, I get that yeah, vibe. Yeah, I, I mean, you weren't beating him, right? Unless he cracked. Like, and I, I'll be honest, I would just try to hit him. Like, 
You know, <laughs> I, that, I knew that was the only way I could beat him. The dude probably hated me, if, I'll be honest, at first. That, as it went, I wasn't that... I'm talking mainly his first year in, because he had a lot of hype. Yeah. And I was that guy, like, dude, you're... I would hit him every chance I got. <laughs> I'll be honest. I love that. Yeah. But racing him, I remember Glenn Helen, he rode the four stroke at Yeah. 04. After he won I think he already well, wrapped three. Oh, it would have been oh four. Oh four, it was oh four, yeah. He already wrapped the title up, so I think he's like, Oh, let me ride the four stroke, Glenn Helen. And Mitch gave him a customer setup, you know, like cust- like you you call in to get an engine done. Okay, here it is. No, nothing close to what we had. No way. That dude beat me by 58 seconds because I got in the second moto. I got second in the moto. He almost beat me by a minute. Bro. On on a bike that was probably, you know, not that great. That's fucked up. And just think if he was on, say, Mitch's bike at the time. I mean, pretty <laughs> unreal. What he would do on a 125, I mean, that, it was unreal. No, no one else will, will ever do do nothing like that as much as it sucks like to be in that era and like race with that dude yeah it sucks like that's a crazy time to be involved in supercross though you know yeah and even my first year 450 you know we had i had had james ricky and chad right those three pretty hard to beat Mm. i was four i got fourth in the series was fourth place guy got two podiums that year but man to beat to get on the box with those three, how good they were and how consistent they were, and yeah, those that was a tough era. Yeah, and to it's like just trying to be a quarterback when Tom Brady's playing football. Mm-hmm. It's like you're a fucking great quarterback, but you're there's Tom Brady. Yeah, and it's just that there's some there's just some freak component that some people have, yeah. and it's just a like say I'd say Jet has it. You know, there's there's one and one every maybe two every. 15 years you know that come along that are special Mm. and what was the like the personality like in that because i feel like james is a the young james like that real early james he was so kind of like outside of the box and i feel like over his career he just kind of got more reclusive and more like just away and over because i i hung with that dude little one like when I was at PC, he was Cowie and dude, he was cool. Yeah. Like, and yeah. And then he just, I would agree with you, like less social kind of closed off. Yeah. I'm not sure why, why, why that would be, but yeah, he was pretty, uh, his 125 day at Supercross, he was, he put on a show, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it just, just went away. Mm-hmm. I, I'd love to, I mean, I got my own theories on it and I, from like being around him and, and stuff. Like, I just think it's what worries me with like Jet to these days with yeah. like all the shit people are giving him and the booze and stuff like i mean dude i was i was at races where like people would with jdr because malcolm was on the team and there'd be people like yelling the most racist fucked up shit it's gnarly right and pe- and and people i've like talked about it before and then people in the comments would be like that didn't happen i'm like okay well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay bro cool but it's like no I, it's there i think sure. they dealt with so much shit and they kind of just copped it like yeah. I never really heard them making a big deal about it. Yeah, no. They never really. No, I've I've, I've heard it myself. It, it, yeah, quite often. Yeah. So I think you know you have the media pressure. You have a a black dude dealing with a bunch of racism in like a super white sport, yeah. and it, you just go like, yeah, fuck this. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I'm gonna fly private to the races. I'm gonna go and win, and then I'm gonna I'm out here. I'm gonna dip. You know. But he's kind of come back around now. Yeah. It seems like yeah. Yeah, which I think is cool. Like it kind of had, it kind of had to happen. Yeah. Do you imagine like being that guy that did what he did for the sport, and then when you retire, you just never, you never come back. No one, no, yeah, like that'd be, that's odd. That'd be odd, and it'd be like a waste, mm-hmm. you know. And like, it's like when you, it's like if a chick just breaks up with you and never talks to you again, <laughs> and you'd be like, what the fuck did I do? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But that Earl uh, to be around that early on and just to like the oh four but uh, the oh three or oh two buds creek ride and like to be in that era would well, have was, been insane i was leading that moto i feel yeah i feel I, like the moto were. yeah the moto he yeah i was leading that moto where he came from from last and i thought i had it in the bag you know and <laughs> I, I saw his 
that pink, I think he was wearing pink gear. I remember yeah. seeing it out of the corner of my eye, like, oh shit. Motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. He, who he who was, took him out on the start? It was a Yamaha or Troy guy, I'm pretty sure. It might have been me. I don't know. Ah, oh, maybe. I don't think it was because no. he parked who it was like the Sellards, maybe, or maybe. And yeah. he fully parked. I was like waiting for him to <laughs> like you watch the replay of the of the thing and he come down one of the insides of like the off campers and just fully park the guy and just, I think it was yeah. seller too yeah, yeah, yeah. it must have been but like to do that on that race when everyone's on four strokes Bud's Creek is and that probably track's not the easy most... to pass on either it's not he was making two or three passes at a time <laughs> yeah per, per <laughs> corner. oh it would have been so frustrating yep but then I think in in Supercross the level that you had in 04 he was obviously on on a different different coast but i mean you you guys had a pretty high level yeah. going at that time yeah that was a good year for me and man i'm bummed in in vegas i i kind of choked in the main um because man that, that whole day i was i was just as fast as him my, yeah my, i remember my heat i won my heat race and my heat race i think it was a tick faster and i don't know i, I think that the hype of it all yeah just got to me because i fully choked i think i got fourth I think Ramsey, uh, Roncada, Roncada gave yeah, him a run. It was James, Ron, Ron, Ramsey. And then I got you. fourth, which I all day I was better than, you know, but anyway, that was one that, that gets to me where that was one I got in my own head and fully choked. Yeah. I'd say. But I mean, how, how much pressure is like, would you feel internally to know that you could potentially well, beat the, this dude? And that it was everybody, everyone... everybody around me. Cause nobody, nobody beats James, right? So I think like everybody's looking at lap times. Like, oh, your heat race, mm. and um, a Carpenter, a good you know, he was a good buddy of mine. He was James's teammate in there. He rode the four stroke for Factory Cowie. He said James was freaking out before the you know because they everybody's looking at lap time. They're looking at heat race times, right? And then yeah, he's, no, I he's choked. IT, I and then I he... choked. <laughs> <laughs> That was a crazy race, though, Roncada. What a nut. Oh, dude, dude you... Roncada was unreal when he wanted to be the. He yeah, would what, trip me out. What's up with that? Because we were teammates that year, so I got to. And he gave me, we rode West Coast together, so there was plenty of races he gave me a run. Yeah. Especially, like, the only th reason I beat him was because of my fitness. Mm. That dude would be up in the, in the lounge, you know, in between the heat and the main, eating uh, cheese dogs, <laughs> Dr. Pepper. And uh, some Doritos. That was his. <laughs> so he was just special, like a freak talent that yeah. just didn't apply in the yeah. in the way that he could have. You think? Yeah, and he, maybe he was one of those guys. If he did go all in, he wouldn't have been as good. I don't, you know. There's, cause I've seen guys like that, right? Like, yeah, that if they, well, Kenny's kind of like that in a sense. You like know? say, oh, if, if only they would do X, Y, and Z, they would be a champion. Say, yeah, has so much talent, but. You have them do X, Y, and Z. Uh, sometimes it doesn't translate, right? I don't know. Yeah, well, I think so. Like Kenny is a good example of that. It's like he just there's a percentage of fun and work ratio that he has yep. to have. I'm the, just, I'm the same way. I would say. Yeah, to just like exist. And I feel like that's where these, what do you call it, the team like team training camps or whatever, like where they're all doing facilities. Facility. There yeah. you go. It works for some guys, but there's going to be that guy it doesn't work for. Yeah. And his career is, it's, you know, I mean, it could be in and out yeah. before you know it. Yeah. Well, I think there's like a, there's, I think it's kind of just a rule in life of like, you, you do get what you sacrifice for, right? Like the size of the return that you would get is based on the amount of sacrifice you put into the thing. Yeah. And it's like, you look at Villo's career, all in, all sacrifice, zero fun, zero life, just mm -hmm. nothing. Yeah. Won everything, left. Dunge, same thing, Ricky. Yeah. And it's like, then they're gone. Mm -hmm. And it's like that, it's it's not sustainable. No, it isn't. And mm -hmm. it's like, you, and that's what I was saying before. It's like, if you want to be the guy where you're like, I love this. This is, I love this. This is like a, a job. I want to do well at it. But it's like I don't want to burn myself in three, four years. You know, mm -hmm. I want to do this for fifteen. I think I think Anderson has a good perspective on that. Mm. 
you know, just he, he obviously does the work, you know, because the dude doesn't. But I don't know, he does it a little different than most. And I think that's what that's why he's gone longer at a high level, my opinion. Yeah, and I think, yeah, some guys maybe just make that choice to where it's like I need a certain amount of longevity out of this, mm-hmm. you know, because... I think you just got to know who you are as a person. Mm-hmm. What, what would... What would what would uh, bring the best out of you? You know what I mean? Some it's going to be this, some it's going to be that. Obviously, you got to do work. There's no, mm, there's, there's no, way, there's around no way around it. But how you do the work and the environment you do the work in, if that makes sense, yep, yep. I think it could be different for each guy. Yeah, well, you look at James 2007, 2008. You know, 2007, he has the injury, like obviously would have won that championship and then he goes out and then he comes back 2008 perfect season Mm -hmm. you know but then it's like that was that was it that was the best James that we got after that it it was like he just that level of commitment to be on the elder it's just like I'm not that I'm not that guy yeah and it's like you can't fake that level of but then Ricky it just like lived to do that work no for sure you know there's like a it just comes down to that personality yeah, if Ricky didn't do the work, he wouldn't have been as good as he. That's just what drove him. That's what, right? Yeah. Do you think that, like, what do you think about talent as a guy that's seen all the errors and been on racetracks with the most talented guys of all time? Like, where would you even put a guy like Ricky to pure talent? And it's like, what is what? talent in a sense? Yeah. I mean, Ricky, What he wasn't as... I don't know. It wasn't as pretty to watch, right, as, say, Jet. But, man, that dude had something special, the will to win. The, I don't know, just he was special in that way. Uh, different, different. And then than, that can overcome the physical talents in a and sense, I, And I hear, I hear Ricky say sometimes, like, he's not that talented of a dirt or whatever he's Yeah. I watched him from when he was on, you know, mini, you know, 60s. Dude, unreal on a dirt bike. mm like you know what I mean, talent wise, speed wise, raw speed. Yeah, it's not like he was. It's not like he just won on fitness, right? <laughs> yeah, like, you know, like oh, I'm just I gr- I got to where I was so fit that I, you the speed has to be there. Yeah, and that dude had speed better than anybody throughout his whole life. Yeah, he just had he had the speed, he had the work ethic, and he had that desire that you know had, the will to win. Yeah, he had everything. Just wasn't as pretty when he did it. Yeah, and then it's like when you've got other guys that look like a Kevin Windham, you think like, oh, he's better. Like he's a better rider than Ricky. He, but he probably doesn't is have the, you know. a better dirt bike rider, right? Yeah. If you want. But race a dirt bike racer, that there more comes into play, right? Yeah. Yeah, you, and you wonder what, like let's say a guy like Kevin Windham, like probably physically more gifted, and all of the same opportunities of in terms of like great equipment, train full time. Like there's a, there's a certain there's a few things you need, right? You need really good bikes. You need a team that can service those bikes and like get them to the racetrack. And then you need a the time to just work on dirt bike racing, and that's it. Yeah, you know. So it's like it's it's not like there's these crazy amounts of variables that you need to like it's not like being a formula one driver like there's formula one you need to be on this team or this team or you're never going to win a race and then you need to be on this team or this team to get fifth and like we don't really have that. no not that I, I would say right now i mean you put jet on any manufacturer he's probably gonna he'd probably be better on some worse on somebody he's still gonna probably win right yeah so i don't know like i think it is there though like because i've gone to teams where i'm like ah just if I, if I would have made a different decision, maybe it would have been different. Yeah. But that's all hindsight, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. You were, you rode some interesting bikes yeah. too. Like you came in, in the four stroke era and then you're on the craziest pro circuit bike. Yeah. And then you went to factory Honda, which in 08 was like magic. And then in 09, I'm just going off stock bikes. 08 magical bike. 09, Maybe not the best. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> and then you went on the Suzuki, which was a pretty good bike. Flip flopped like, that though. I was Suzuki first. Oh, you were Suzuki first. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then then Honda. Yeah. But yeah, so it's like the Suzuki bike was pretty good bike, but like new 
maybe not the most resourced team i'm guessing in yeah. in like comparison and then like you rode the new style yamaha you rode suzuki's again later in the career with h and mm. like so you've rode a lot oh, man, of bikes. I, two two years at a time i i never stayed i yeah i've rode for everybody yeah so what was the that pro circuit four stroke development like and when like did you know that you guys had or when did you know you had the best bike Man, those were scary days, honestly. Um, just because those things blew up so much. Mm. I mean, that year, first year alone, I probably blew up fifty engines. Really? Like not not in like not exaggerating. Like testing, Te just yeah. Practice. I mean, probably even more than that. Like it was on the daily. You know, when you're riding supercross, things would explode. Luckily, I didn't have any big injury. You know, well, you know, I had some big crashes because of it. <clears throat> I remember at Southwick, went, no four, I engine blew it blew a hole like this big out the front of the engine and dented the frame but it sent me through the handlebars like it was one of those but it was on the i mean scary times but we we, we had power though we had more power <laughs> we did have more power than everybody and um but once he started bumping power into it tranny started break everything just started breaking you think you have one you okay we got this fixed something else would break and what do you think everyone was going through that in that era yeah i think so yeah maybe not quite as much as us because we were that pushing, pushing the limits a little more than some i would say but scary times because i mean nowadays that's that's kind of uncommon right you, yeah you get on a bike it's not gonna grenade most likely knock on wood yeah but like you hear some of these kids these days that think you think they hear something or whatever, like which i get it's scary you're riding super crowd you don't want nothing to happen but i, I just think oh, dude you should have been around 20 years ago like did they have any did they give you any warning no you know two strokes you, could, yeah. you, you get a little <laughs> yeah you get a little those things it's, yeah it's just just click boom no i don't know how i got through it honestly, like, Man, oh, and, honestly and I, I look back at it and like and it never even crossed my mind maybe, maybe I, that's stupid i guess or whatever you want to call it but I never thought twice about it. Fuck that. Which is kind of crazy to think. I know that I'm older and you think back like, dude, you, I would be gun like now, now if I knew that was a situation at 42, <laughs> you know what I mean? I would be very gun shy and I'd be jumping front end high. Like just because oh. when yeah, the blow yeah, goes, it just... I mean, you're not going to be over the front. <laughs> That's crazy, man. And even like what, what were the carbies like too? Cause I know the Hondas, like the Geico Barsha era, he just said the thing would just bog like fuck. Cause that, that's what people would say. You rev your bike so much. And he'd yeah. be like, dude, I had to. Because See, I didn't have the, too much of that on the more two stroke days. I would say I didn't tell with that big, that Honda 125 bogging on the face of triple. And dude, th those were scary days too. Those things are so slow. And yeah, <laughs> so it was pretty cool for, to grow up in the 125 era. And kind of go all the way through to race 450s you know pretty cool it's wild that more bikes didn't blow up in races back then right like with having that many issues and bikes blowing up daily that like you basically surprising got, it did got happen through seasons outdoors though that year i had a lot of dns yeah and so, luckily luckily the following year the year i won the title i didn't have any like because i think the prior year i had six six dnfs or something motos something like that quite a few but they basically just pushed and pushed and pushed to get as much power as they could mm -hmm. out of the bikes and they were just on like such a fine line mm -hmm. yeah and until he started getting trannies built and you know just re getting parts built which is a process right yeah by that second year we were good though i i, I didn't feel the bike was unsafe didn't blow up as much just that first year <laughs> dude it was scary yeah so bt was telling me that the year that he rode the the first year he rode for mitch he was just like oh fuck we're on like we're legally cheating yeah because the bike because so he was getting trannies made from like this company in the uk yeah right? the extract yeah and they used to do all custom shit all coded like just fully built these gearboxes yeah those ain't cheap and a, but yeah apparently it was worth like two or three horsepower or like four horsepower something insane yeah i don't know if it actually has a a horsepower effect i think more you could put the power where you want it if that makes sense yeah like tranny ratios and, and obviously 
the shifting's a little smoother and all that. I could be wrong on that. I don't think you get a horsepower gain on it. Yeah, that. okay. But those, th- it started this run of just complete insane dominance by yeah, PC. Were, right? W- what What was it? Was it just the bike? Was it like Mitch himself? I don't think so. I think it was the talent he hired. Mm. I mean, yeah, his bike was better, a little better than, but I think you put Villapoto on. Yeah, Villa was going to put win. a, yeah. who, like the guys that were winning, you put Townley who was, Put him on Yamaha, tr- uh, whatever the bike, uh, second tier bike was at the time. He's still going to win, mm. my opinion. Yeah. So I think I think it comes down to the talent. You, you're, the team's not going to, the team's never going to make up for a rider's deficiencies to win, mm. in my opinion. Like, yeah, you could help a rider, but you're not going to, you're not going to make a fourth place rider win by. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong on that, but that's my opinion. No, no, I mean, you'd know better than me. <laughs> but there, was there some kind of like... So m- I think it was Mitchell. the talent. I think it was just the talent he was able to hire throughout yeah. those years. Yeah. And then as it went, I mean, just... I mean, a lot of them just... That should have worked out, didn't work out. Just mm. injuries and stuff, right? AC. I mean, he had some success, but later, you know, Forkner, just injuries. Yeah. So I think he had the... Still along the line, he had the right guys speed wise. It's just circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's, there's got to be something because people always talk about it like his mentality and like just Mitch is like who he is. And there has to be some kind of like byproduct of if you go, oh, I go there, I have to win. You know, like 100%, maybe that, yeah. Maybe that does something to people's mentality. And especially in that era, like I think that has maybe gone a little bit, but I think like, every year that that dynasty kept mm-hmm. winning it like it almost had its own momentum and then if you knew mitch signed me yep. i'm the guy that's gonna win and then that dude wins and then the next guy so it just kind like of like saw, feeds into itself dino was on here he kind of t- talked about that and i think yeah I, th- I think it i think it is like you you were signed and i wonder now that they haven't been winning that's not quite there like as much i don't know no and yeah i think that that's a real thing you know it's like they almost have to and i feel like this year obviously they're they're doing great this year right they almost had to kind of reinvent it right reinvent the wheel a little try to figure out how to win again yeah and i mean the 250 class is a hard one because like there really is clearly better bikes sometimes no there is yeah. you know and it's a, it's a 450 it's kind of it seems like it's more you've got to have the right team that can like want to take your feedback i know like well, I'm, I'm, I can assume that when you were on Suzuki with Ricky, the direction you wanted to go with the bike, they were like, <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, cool, yeah, cool, bro. Yeah, yeah, we did it for you. Yeah, uh-huh. all those, everything we said. Yeah. You see what, it just won right there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How about you ride the bike that just beat you by and, a minute? And it, I would say it, it wasn't completely like that. They, they still would test and try to try to make me happy, but the, the, <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. And it's, and it's still like that. It's going gonna, it's gonna to always be that. Like that. Well, you've got like a certain amount of resources, yeah. you know, as a, as a team. And it's, but I think, and I think the teams that aren't like that are more successful across the board. Mm. All their, if, if you, cause when you, when you do it like that, yeah, that guy's going to be happy. Maybe one of the other guys might be, but right. Yeah. Well, I, and, and I also don't think it's like that hard i mean this might be sound stupid but it's like i don't think it's that hard to get a good setup bike especially in like this day and age it's like it really just feels like it's time and good communication it's not like some crazy fancy parts of the thing that's no it is just yeah time and the right guy working with the right guy mm. making the right change and putting in enough time it seems like that's probably more the answer but i think sometimes in that process, some egos get involved yep. to where uh, I want to, I want my my idea to be on the bike, or yep. you know, and that's just which sucks, right? And just holds the back holds back the team when it's like that. Oh man, for sure. And I'm and I'm I'm sure you rode bikes in your career that and maybe even the end of your career where it's like that. This is awesome. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm probably a bit past my prime, but I've. I can, I have the freedom to make the bike how I want to make it, you know? Well, I'll give you an example. When I, when I rode for Honda, factory Honda, um, that 08, the 08 bike was great bike, right? 
but I had no idea. I never rode a stock Honda Oe mm. bike. They just it was straight on the team, straight onto a works bike, which already had the works frame. That you know, I think that was probably. I don't know what year that model came out, 04, 05. So it was probably like the third year on that yeah. on that model. Um, so they're pretty far along with their development on with the guys they had prior. So I, di- I didn't get to go through that process on the bike. I ended up getting hurt, I think, the fourth round. So I, I broke my wrist. So when I came back from injury, they sent me a stock bike with a pipe and revalve suspension. Like, here, start riding this. Um, and then once your wrist is okay, we'll send you your works bike. No, I was at Ricky's at the time. So I started riding. I was riding with BT, and he had his works bike. I had my stock bike, and I was, I was, you know, I think I was beating him, I'll be honest, like, was better than him. And I remember thinking in my head, oh, wait till I get my works bike. I'm going to be blowing everybody's doors off. My works bike finally shows up. It goes the other way. I'm slower. I hate this thing. So I, I, I tried to, like, figure that out. Okay, what, why don't I like it? It was the front, you know, there was, there were, reinforcing the frame and making it more rigid and so i went into kehoe's office like hey i, I want to try to race more of a stock or at least let's go through the process of trying to figure it out they wouldn't they wouldn't do it you know and i'm like i could win on this you know like just give me what what i want and they, they wouldn't do it you trip me out isn't that insane and i even put it on myself at one point like dude just put it all on me you know i want to win yeah, I want to be comfortable. I want to. I just wouldn't have a bar. Mm-mm. That's blows my mind. Like I had a very similar conversation with Coop. So there, I I don't know for sure, but basically that last kind of outdoors that he did with KTM, he had like the a bit of time off. He went home and he was riding just like three fifty EXCs and shit. And he's like, "This is fucking insane. Right? Like yeah. this is so good. <laughs> this but it's like a three fifty trail bike." And then, so I think they were doing some kind of bracing on the frame back then as well. And he's like, I just want a stock frame. Like, can I just race a stock frame? They wouldn't let him. So then Crazy. I think he, he bought one. And I think that, I remember hearing this. Yeah, yeah, they fully just like, they did it. I think it was kind of the nail in the coffin for his relationship yeah. with KTM. Yeah. But he just did it, you know? And like, w- no one starts riding a stock bike. And, and I, it, that seems crazy to me. And I know that's how we did... Uh, the last PC model, what was it, 21? It came out, Cowie came out with their new 250. That's that's how we approached it. We started from stock, bone stock. You know, what is this thing, you know? And I think that's the best approach. And you start throwing everything at it that worked on the previous model or, oh, we used to do this. Let's, you know, like you, you have to go through that process or else you'll be in left field or can get in left field. Yeah, and I think even just as a, as a pro dude to – to get out and just like ride the stock motorcycle, like just get to know the thing, mm-hmm. you know, and, and a stock bike changes like 10 hours. It's a completely different motorcycle. You know, you put a couple of days riding on it and you like really bed the thing in and you can feel like, Oh, okay. I would like this out of this. And yeah. it's just like one thing at a time, you know? Mm-hmm. And it, that whole Eric Kehoe conversation, it's like, Hey dude, like, let me just say I'm basically riding a stock motorcycle like this thing is so fucking good yeah i don't need all of the fruit blows but, me away that that it's like that i don't know i'm sure there's still it's still like that in places you know and, and i'm not sure why what drives that yeah i mean i wonder it's it's probably something just to do with like the justification of like your job yeah, maybe you know yeah. like you think that if you're a big time team manager and you're getting paid all this money and then you've got suspension guys and you've got motor guys, you've got all these guys that kind of like depend on that motorcycle. You got three years of development and this guy saying he wants to ride the stock one. Like, yeah. It's probably just like not the right look on the yeah. personnel, the personnel or the, the, the team, you know? Mm-hmm. Cause then I went the following year. Um, I didn't even know if I was going to race. Cause that was when the recession hit and yeah. there was no money in the sport. My deal ran out and with Honda and I didn't, I signed with that Valley, Valley Yamaha team, yeah. the privateer team. No, I didn't, I didn't sign that deal until I think it was almost December. You know, I went through that cause I did designations in Italy, except October, I think it was. I went all the way till December, like not knowing what I was going to do. I didn't ride a dirt bike. That ended up being one of the funnest years though. Like 
it's me and Frankie. My I took my mechanic Frankie uh, from Honda. You know, he went over there with me, and dude, we had a great time. Yeah, and like the you'd go from being in like a box of just like factory Honda, you got this, 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 and this, to just like, all right, boys, do yeah. whatever. Here's I remember your bike those bikes and... seemed pretty good. It wasn't bad. In Supercross, it was actually all right. I didn't mind it. Um, I did try to ride it at an outdoor that year and hated the thing. Yeah. Because that, what year was that, 10? 10. That was, that was the first the year. Yamaha. Yeah. 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 And I, I re- went and tested uh, a couple of days with like the factory Yamaha guys, KYB, or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And then I did two days with Bones Pro Circuit. And I, I liked Bones' stuff way better. And I went that route, which I think really helped me. Because a, a lot of those guys, they struggled with that bike. And I didn't have the same struggles they did. Yeah, right. Yeah, because Jimmy's. Jimmy really struggled on, no, on no, that like thing. James really wasn't a big yeah. fan. Yeah, yeah, dude, I remember. But I, I didn't see. I was really good on that thing. Like I, I, did, I liked that bike. Wow, what was there was one Anaheim in practice where James just fucking yards. That. <laughs> <laughs> like, do you remember? Mm. Oh, might have been like a two or something. In from, ten. Yeah, from yeah. memory, it was like a step on, step off, and the thing just. And he just <laughs> cartwheeled for like the entire rhythm section, just like fully walked off. And I remember thinking, oh, I almost died Ooh. on died on that bike, man, at uh, St. Louis. That same jump, Villapoto broke oh, his leg on. Yeah, late in the race, I um, I was charging for a podium, so I was going hard, and it was I think it was two laps to go, and I I didn't crash like he did. I I cased it and then into into the berm, and yeah, the bike, yep. bike got me, and I ended up crushing nine ribs and collapsed my lung but since since it was lap 18 and i was going so hard that my heart rate was you know 200 or whatever since i did all i couldn't breathe i i was i remember laying there and i couldn't i couldn't even catch a little breath and with your heart rate at 200 you know that that's obviously not good and fully my vision went out and i i didn't know i'm like am i am i dying i couldn't quite you know i was everything went dark but i could still kind of catch these baby breasts and then they i don't know they got me to the hospital put a chest tube in oh and i remember talking to the doctor i was like dude i i felt like i was about to die and he's like yeah you you were really close i don't know what my oxygen level was but they, they said it got super low just because i couldn't yeah heavy fuck that's gnarly how do you how do you mentally come back after that are you ever the same do you think i don't know i i think Probably some days you are, some days you aren't, right? Never really. I felt like I, I've never really thought about it. I don't know. Yeah, I never. I just kind of push it and just push mm. it aside. One of those things, I think. Yeah. It is pretty wild how the brain works. Like it is. That. It it but, quickly forgets. Yeah. Even when you're talking about the PC days, when you blow up a fucking bike a week, and then you just send it off the yeah everything. And you're just like you're just like well, okay. even I just dealt with it recently. You know, just dealt, dealing with the injuries I dealt with this year. You know, like. When I first was laying there, crashed like, dude, what am I doing? You know, first month you're just like, dude. But then you just after a while you're like, all right, let's let's get back after it. Mm. Yeah, and I think I don't know. But there's it's such like an easy justification in a sense of like, well, I could get hit by a car. Yeah, yeah I could do you this. Could say, I yeah, could, yeah, yeah. That's so easy to but justify. That's just yeah. It's, I mean, dirt bikes are dangerous, right? Yeah, straight up. Like yeah. there's there's no way around it. You can, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a gnarly game, dude. But and I just, guess if you're scared, you shouldn't be on one. Like I, I don't know. Yeah. I haven't gotten to that point. Like I, you know, never. And if I ever do, I'm not gonna throw my leg over one. Man, I I hit that point. In, I saw Andrew McFarlane die, and I was like right in front of him. I was like, I was actually wasn't filming the. La- I was there filming him. Like we. He picked me oh, up wow. from the airport. We drove to the track together, like the whole deal. And he was just on a heater. It was like early in, in the practice. They sent the 450s out first for the first, like just one of those days, you know. And then I watched him crash. And then I remember I I, I was racing then, you know, like I fucking loved it. And uh, I rocked up to a start line, gate dropped, everyone went. I just sat there. Yeah, you just... And I just went, no. Nah. I fucking rode back to the pits. My dad's like, what's, what's wrong? You all good? It's like kind of like half choking up a bit, you yeah. know? And I just parked the bike. I didn't ride for, fuck, that was, I think I think it was 2010 that happened maybe from memory. And I don't think I really rode again until like 2017. Oh, really? A long time. 
yeah, yeah, I just fully it was the podcast that kind of got me but back I think into writing. It's probably good you didn't though. If you if you had any of that in the back of your head while you're trying to do it, that's it's that's when things happen too, right? It's you gotta be yeah, you gotta be focused and but even still now, like I think um my skill level, like I would say I'm a skilled dirt bike rider. Like I can I could go and ride and been riding forever. And you never forget that, right? Like it's nah. just always there. But I ain't committing to shit. Yeah. You know, like I'll go to parlor and some days just be like, you know what? There's a kicker on that up ramp. I ain't fucking jumping it. <laughs> but that's got to take some anxiety away from you, right? Like you, because then you could just, eh. yeah, I just check like, your ego. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. That's the biggest thing is you have to be like comfortable and not looking cool mm-hmm. and people looking at you like, why the fuck have you got expensive forks on your bike? Yeah. Yeah. Why this, this could I can barely ride. And it's like, well, I feel like I can ride just. Really not worth the fucking risk. Enjoy it this, for what it is, right? Yeah, dirt bikes. And at that. this point, I ain't, I ain't qualifying for no rate. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I don't need this that bad. So it's like, maybe, yeah, maybe. See, I wonder head. I wonder for myself if if I could ever get to that point because I, I don't think that would be fun to me. If mm. That makes sense. Like, for me, pushing it is what's fun. And, you know, not necessarily living on the, like, on the, not on the edge. Because, like, even nowadays when I'm doing my, I don't ride on the edge, but. I don't know. No, no, Does I know. Make... Yeah, yeah. And there's times where I leave the track. I'm like, it just wasn't that fun. Yeah. Because you're not flowing. Mm-hmm. If you're rolling a certain jump or a certain section, then it's like it kills the whole momentum mm-hmm. of the track. That's why, honestly, it's why I like Lynn Helen. Yeah. Because there's no fucking jumps. Yeah. I can just... do everything the whole time. And I, I feel like I can send it to like my own comfort zone. But yeah, yeah. it's like I just always had that in the back of my mind. Like I just, I'm not really willing to get hurt for this you know it's understandable yeah it's just not not my not my thing and it's like you feel like you just learn to enjoy different shit in a in a way yeah you know what i mean and but i think i think over time though like i also just wasn't very good back then and i didn't really work at it Mm -hmm. and i kind of had it in my head that i wasn't a very good writer so I think you just end up being who you tell yourself that you are yeah. in a sense. Yeah. And then I th- as soon as like started doing this, started riding again, I had free time. I went and trained. I'd like started doing something. Did you right. get the itch throughout that time? <sighs> throughout the, the years that I didn't ride was when I was living here and I was going to all the races and I never had health insurance here. So I was yeah. like kind of scared of that. And then I was surfing, I was playing golf. Like I just kind of like yeah, got other things. That, yeah, I just yeah. got into different stuff. It wasn't That's until cool. I started doing this that I kind of made me yeah. want to ride again. That's cool. But yeah, it took took a long time. And it, fuck, my brother's so good at it too. Like it was just one of those things. Where I'm he's like, still he's still riding. Then he's fucking like, rips, bro. That's cool. Yeah, but um, but yeah, I mean, I ended up finding like a a, a, a love for it again through through this. And now I can't imagine not riding yeah and i kind of wish i didn't stop but it kind of it is what it is it's like me i've kind of got a new love for the sport from a different you know just a on perspective the, te- the, the yeah. technical side like i i really like the testing and the engineering side of it and trying to make a, a dirt bike better and why is this one better why you know I'm, I'm trying to learn on that end which has been great i've been been exposed to a lot of different engineers and a lot of smart people over the last you know, year doing this triumph deal oh man and i've heard that the bike's fucking amazing too it's, it's good yeah it is it, it does everything pretty well um super light nimble bike yeah I'm, I'm excited for everybody to to try one and see what their feedback is i was supposed to do oh, i got invited to go to the the launch gainesville yeah oh, okay you uh, gonna go nah okay nah i'll just fuck i gotta work yeah yeah, one of those, one of those deals. But I'm like, that was one of those, you know, you know, you see like those fucking inspirational things on Instagram where it's like, you, the successful people learn how to say no, like yeah, all that yeah, bullshit. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm sitting at that email like, ah, I got to fucking say no to this, don't I? <laughs> I got to say no to this, don't I? I went and rode there last week, actually. You were breaking them in? Yeah, broke some in. I haven't rode there since 98 really yeah it's pretty cool to go back and ride it's that pretty place. dope track it right? is really fun so yeah. that's the well minis track isn't yeah it? yeah exactly Fuck. now i'm pissed <laughs> come on book a flight <laughs> i might have to yeah uh so how did that how did that come up so you're doing the pro circuit testing thing mm-hmm. and then 
is that people knew you were testing and it kind of like led into it or how did it come about? Yeah. So I was doing, I did Mitch's stuff for what, five years, yeah. tet, tet, doing all this testing and, um, 2020, um, Ricky, Ricky hit up Mitch and like, Hey, can I use Ivan for a week? You know, basically one of those deals and Mitch agreed to it. And I didn't even know what it was either. I was just like, I knew after Daytona. Uh, it's all like NDAs. And yeah. Shit at that like point, I was eh? like after Daytona Supercross, I knew I was flying to the goat farm to, you know, test for five days. And once I got there, I kind of knew what was up. And so that was, that was the first, uh, right after Daytona 2020 was my first experience with dealing with Triumph and they were kind of trying to figure out, they knew they were going to make a, a motor, a dirt bike, just trying to, they were trying to figure it all out. And yeah, four years later, we, we got a bike. So from what I heard, it started, they it basically like, they had a KTM-ish kind of like base and then it, they were like building it up. But then you know, I, the pictures that I saw, I'm like, this is a completely different motorcycle. Yeah. So like, what was the process over those four years to like kind of get to where it is now? I wasn't involved initially, okay. you know, but. Um, so yeah. when it got to you, it was just a triumph. I did a little bit initially on some other bikes to get some, some feedback, like, okay, where, where do we want to go? You yeah. know, cause we're, we're starting from a clean slate, right? You yeah make what we want we obviously tried all the other bikes to see you know what where do we want to go with it and that's the bike that's that's where they what they came up with was and does everything pretty well so what do you like when you rode the other stock bikes like what would you say is like the highlight point of each that you tried to like take and put into the triumph obviously like the yamaha the motor's very strong stock it's insane uh, eh? yeah it, it's pretty good i didn't really care for the chassis myself but yeah you know, that's that's stock right would you have rode the you would have rode the 22 version mm -hmm. right yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 so i haven't rode the the current one but um and just i don't know they each they each have like like the cowie does every, does everything pretty well it's like kind say. of broadly good mm -hmm. ktm i don't know i didn't really care for it too much to be honest with you um, Did you ride KTM in your career? You've one, one time, time for, uh, I filled in for yeah, I filled in for mil, for mil slaps. Yeah, okay. And I wrote that was the older 450. Yeah, um, and I ended up riding the 350. I rode four rounds on the 450, and then they came up with the idea. Like I was kind of struggling with it. Hey, let's try the 350. And I was actually faster on it, like lap time wise. But so I started racing that, and uh, results didn't really get any better. But I definitely enjoyed myself a lot more. Yeah, yeah. That was a fun bike. Yeah. And then so what on the KTM, like so there was nothing that you were like, okay, I want. <laughs> there was nothing you wanted to extract from the KTM into the Triumph? Mm, I would say the the, the ergonomics, that like mm, pretty, they feel good. Feel eh? pretty good, yeah. 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 But I didn't care for the, the rear end of that bike too much. Yeah, um, very busy, eh? Mm -hmm. Like kind of side to side when they're stopping. Yeah, just unpredictable, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, the Triumph bike, I'm, I'm very pleased with it. It's it's a good bike. Yeah. So I heard from people that have rode it that they're not paid by a Triumph. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like it's probably one of the best 250s, yeah. which I find pretty crazy that you can come out with a bike that's very good in your first go. It's not then, easy. Not easy, right? And then Timmy, uh, Tim Ferry, uh, Evan Ferry gets the fucking hole shot right? from the outside in the LCQ. Granted, it's the LCQ, but it's like, dude, that's still... But if you watch the main event, too, he was out there. Like, he he was up in the mix, too. He just got got punted into the wall. So It was bad, too. No, I thought it was a good showing for, for the bike. You know, first opening showing for the for the triumph 250 it was good yeah what did you think working with bobby yeah it was good it, it caught me off guard for you talking back when i rode for him oh or, oh yeah well because you rode with yeah, yeah just okay. for a feeling because i feel like he's a guy you'd get along well yeah, with. yeah no i get along great with bobby and scuba and yeah we got a good group of guys um and they brought dave arnold over on board the old t team honda yeah. team manager yeah just for his knowledge and chassis and that development so been been able to work with some some great people and, and learn a lot it's been good bobby is a i'm very glad that he's back in the sport yeah no, bobby's awesome he when he went away with the whole husky deal and how it went down i mean i actually still don't really know 
the backstory of it, but I'm assuming it sucked for, yeah. for him. Yeah. Uh, but man, I so my ex girlfriend, uh, her one of her best friends is Bobby's daughter. Oh, really? Okay. So I like fully just like started hanging out with yeah. that whole family and just like a fully non. So they live here, like hunting, hunting a beach or something. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And he was just the fucking coolest, the no, coolest he's guy. Dude. He's a good. Dude. And I feel like he's probably not everyone's cup of tea in like this small industry in a way because i just don't know that he like wants to play by any no, he's specific just... like rules in a in a sense like he's just a old school straight shooter he is kinda, black, black and white yeah, yeah kind of yeah. dude and which I, I appreciate i i think you get and it's for, for racing you get you get places a lot quicker when things are black and white right when you're dancing around things and you know it's good and so what was your, what was the program of like testing and developing that bike? Like you basically, so it was Matt Walker's facility got rented by Triumph and it was, you just go in there and it's just the constant yeah. test, 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 test. Yep. And then as, the, as new parts would come in, try them out. Okay. Where do we want to go from here? You know, it's just that trial and error, you know, and it's a process, right? To get stuff built and here we are. We we got got on the racetrack, and I, I, we learned a lot there too. So as we go forward, we're gonna yeah progressing. So so how many like frame versions would you have rode, and like did because it's it'd be interesting to know what's on like the cutting room floor essentially. Like what's... quite a few, um, and even we we got to a point where it was pretty far along, and then we tried some you know tried some other things, and we knew we had to go in that direction. So. Thing, I wouldn't say things got held up, but they had to to make some calls like, okay, it'll get held up for a little bit if we make this call, but it's going to be better. Mm. But I'm glad that they they made the call on the better move. Not, not and so better. what what some examples of that? Like just the frame geometry, you know, like as far as the geometry of the frame. You know, there's you move it a millimeter, five millimeter. I mean, it's a huge huge deal. So it's a little bit of trial and error, and you know, figuring out what it needs. Yeah. And so to me, it looks almost like that 06 Yamaha it does, chassis. Right? Yeah. Has and, that look to it. Yeah. And so does, do you think it would have that kind of like feel in a sense or it's like. That's hard to say. Um, Cause I did ride one of those at one point, but yeah, I don't know. It's hard to say. Cause I mean, five millimeters different. Yeah. You know, like, so it, it could look the same, but geometry, I, I, I couldn't tell you if it's even close as that Yamaha. Yeah. 250. Everyone, it seems like everything's trended so much stiffer. These like last, oh, fuck 10 years, maybe since like the modern four stroke era. I don't know. Maybe since like the alloy frames came in because like mm -hmm. I have a 96 CR 250 and the thing fucking flexes when you kick it. Yeah, it feels like a couch, yeah. <laughs> like, it's actually... I remember the first time I kick-started it, I, I was, like, look, looking at my foot as I kicked it, and it was just, like, raw. <laughs> so we go from that to what we've got now, you know? Yeah. So I feel like Triumph kind of day dot, like, brand new bike. It kind of has a chance to not be that. Was that, like, a a thing that you guys were like trying to be very cognizant of because i just i wonder why the manufacturers have even gone that stiff yeah i'm not sure i i wasn't involved in in at that level you yeah know, okay more once it got to that level here try this what you know yeah i haven't so i wouldn't know i couldn't answer that could you feel the could you feel the bikes just getting stiffer and stiffer and stiffer over your career i would say i yeah, no, because I, I know, like, say, the 06 Suzuki, man, the thing felt rigid up in the neck to me, you yeah. know, like, certain bikes, and almost went, I would say, softer for a minute. I don't know. It's hard to say. I... Yeah, because there's, so, I guess, so many, like, different variables with mm -hmm. it. Were you good at test riding from the outset, do you think? No, I wouldn't say so. I my first like uh, exposure to doing any testing was Yamaha Troy with uh, Ross at Enzo. You know, yep. that, that was kind of the first. And he was always super cool just explaining stuff to me. And because uh, I'll be honest, at first, I would, I, I didn't want to say I didn't know. So I would kind of make, you know, make stuff up. And, 
but that that does nobody any good, right? If you're That's just, very normal, though. I think, I think it is. I yeah. see it. I see it a lot with the younger kids, even now. You know, they don't want to say, oh, "I don't know." You know, which that's better than going down saying it's doing this and it's doing that when you're you're just talking, right? Yeah. So yeah. that that's where it gets tough on the two fifty race team side is you're typically working with young kids, right? Yeah. They don't they don't know much, which they shouldn't. They, they've, never, <laughs> yeah. they've never been exposed to anything, right? So that's where that's where I feel like a test rider like myself is um is a lot more important for the two fifty program than say four fifty. At least once you're going racing. There's yeah. obviously the production side of testing that things got to be right on the bike to have a good base bike, right? But once you go racing, I don't feel like you could you could lean on these 16, 17, 18-year-old kids to develop the motorcycle. You know, mm. like some of them might have a knack for it right off the get-go, but you know, you could get out in left field just as quick as you could make it better, right? Oh, man, 100%. Or maybe even easier. So Yeah. And so when it comes to working with Mitch and Bones, like in every, everything that I've ever seen of you, like it seemed like you fit with those guys super well. Like what, what is it about that combination that you think works so well? I think I work well under, like you're saying, just that black and white environment. Yeah. You know, just, <laughs> yeah. just, it is what it is. It's that way I could say what I want to say. And, you know, it's just that easy back and forth. You get somewhere, you know, when it's, when it's not like that. I don't know. I, I just keep my mouth shut. You know, I'm just, I'm, I'm that kind of person. If it's like that, I'm just, I just won't say anything, you know? So I, I think I work well under that environment where I know I can say what I want to say. It's black and white. And Mitch so. was just that, that yeah. guy to a T. Yeah. That must be cool to be able to actually get with a dude that you can kind of just fully gel with in a sense. And obviously it's a lot easier to get along with Mitch when you're winning and <laughs> no, that, and, I, and I won the whole time I was there, so I, <clears throat> I never had to deal with that that side of him. I would say. Did you see that side of him? Oh yeah, with everybody else. <laughs> oh, dude, he's and he was a lot gnarlier back then than he is now. I'd say mm. just with age, right? With, yeah. you know, he was gnarly. <laughs> he was gnarly. Who? What? Do you have some like uh, the best Mitch Payton story in a sense? Of well, life? I know Paul Carpenter. He. He was on the team in 05. And Mitch, you know, they always, the team always comes to you after, like, if you're not doing a jump or you're not doing something, they're going to tell you, right? Like, hey, you need to do this. And Carpenter, he got fed up. He's a New Yorker. He gets, yeah, he gets all fired up. Fucking quit telling me what to do, you know? <laughs> and Mitch is like, is that, is that what we want? All right. This was like round one or two. <laughs> wow. He, he did not even look at the dude the rest of the season. Didn't speak one word to him. Wouldn't even look at him. The whole whole year, and then like at a certain point, started to to bother Paul. He'd be like, "Dude, dude, won't even freaking look at me, dude." Like, I mean, his bike was still there, his mechanic was still there, you know, still got his paycheck. Wouldn't you? It's like he wasn't even there though. That's crazy. Wouldn't even look at him. <laughs> and the rest of the year, didn't even talk to him. Never said one one word to him. That is some crazy psychological warfare. Like you have to be a fucking G. <laughs> just, but he's, just he's tell you that committed. Yeah, yeah, he's gnarly. <laughs> uh, but he'll do that to you in uh, in his office. You go in there to, you know, whatever the situation. You ask him for something. Just stand there. And he just stare at you, and it's like you wanna you wanna start looking at your shoes, and you know, like you just gotta stare right back. <laughs> 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 Which is intimidating, right? When someone's just not talking. Yeah. Yeah, because Roger Roger has that same kind of vibe. I feel you know when I wrote for him, he's just he just won't say anything, which is worse than getting yelled at, right? Mm, yeah, because you've got to be so sure of yourself in a way to just stand there like a statue yeah. and just fucking mm -hmm. stare. <laughs> just mm -hmm. like, like yeah, yeah. the self doubt, bro. Like the the shit that would be like running through uh -huh. your mind would be way more than they could ever like. Yeah. make you think about you know just sitting there in that silence <laughs> i i would have loved to have been a fly on the wall just watching him and matt walker interact oh yeah that would he love he loved that guy really that's why he was on the team for so long i feel like i mean matt was a great writer too but he just yeah because matt was matt's great like he is crazy yeah in, in, a, in a good way and i see him now because uh you know we're, we're leasing his facility out there in, in georgia and he, he's mellowed out for sure 
Dude, but he's the, still he's still the same. You know, he's got that smirk on his face. Like <laughs> the first time I ever met him was I don't know if it's the same place that it's, I don't know if it's the same facility, but I went to a facility that he was running back in fucking 2010 or whatever. Went there with Wes Williams and the Verb crew, and then he kind of introduced me. He was on a track. He was on his bulldozer. He had no shirt on. He had overalls. One of the overalls <laughs> was undone, and he had a fucking a huge lug <laughs> just yeah. in his lip. <laughs> and he jumped down off the tractor, and then uh, I was like, hey, mate, I'm Jace. And he just goes, I like your French accent. <laughs> <laughs> and just walked off. Yeah. That's all yeah, he that's said. It. I didn't speak to him again yeah. for like, oh. 10, 10 years and then I just see an inbox a DM in my inbox from him with like a voice note yeah, yeah, he wouldn't have even remembered that, yeah, that, that one that was me and uh, no, he was a character I yeah. grew up racing with him from because we're the same age so you know from 10 years old yeah we'd meet up because he was from Florida Georgia, Georgia so I would see him at Loretta's Winter Olympics a few times a year and yeah we'd always <laughs> have our run-ins <laughs> Because he was a wild man on the track, and I was kind of the same, you know, especially when I was younger. I was pretty out of control, just kind of a wing it guy. And yeah, so we had our run ins. Shit would have been funny. <laughs> yeah. What was he like as a teammate? Dude, he would, same as he, he'd just talk shit. He'd be, a, he'd be sitting on the back of the box van. I'm going to kick your ass this weekend. You know, just shit like that. Like, you're just like, dude, Matt, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Nah, I'm for real, dude. You're freaking, you're, you're, you know, he just say shit like that. Oh, uh, dude, the, I love, was it, it was him that stopped when you and Alessi had the thing. He but, was, it was. Oh, I can imagine. He would have just been like, green light, I'm going to ruin this little kid. And when, before that, before that moto, we always had a little team powwow. They were, Mitch was like, hey, if you see him in trouble with, you know, help him out. And he's like, I got your back. And I was like, yeah, whatever. Like, he had my back, though. 100%. <laughs> was that the craziest thing that... That was a wild day. That was a wild day. Which, going there, you know, I had a 35-point lead going in, you know, last race. and Yeah, you yeah, should be chilly. Yeah, I, I wasn't that stressed. You know, just get a couple good starts, you know, whatever. That uh, The first moto, I get, get a good start. I think I was third or fourth. Hepler goes down in front of me on this high speed section in the back. I didn't have time to, to move out of the way, so I tried to wheelie his bike and do Oh, I remember that crash. Yard sale. Luckily, I didn't get hurt. So I go to get back on my bike, go to take off, and I, it's just grinding. I'm like, look down, my chain came off. So my chain come, came off in the crash. So I get down, I put my chain back on. I'm thinking, oh, fuck, is this thing going to stay on? I started, so I start from dead last, and that, I just charged, charged, charged. I am getting 21st. Zero points. Oh. I, I, so I might as well just went back to the yeah, truck. Yeah, just right? go back, yeah. And uh, Lessie wins the moto. There, there was that drama with him and Langston, but they, they ended up giving uh, Lessie the moto win. So it went from 35 to 10 points going into the final moto. I get the, I get a second-place start, I think, behind Villa, Villa little Villa. Um, and I, I took a look back, and I, I didn't see – I saw actually, I saw Jeff Alessi, and he went for the kill first. You know, he, he went for a chop move, but I knew he was there. I checked up, took another look back. I didn't see Mike anywhere, so I continued racing. And then next thing I knew, I was on the ground because he T-boned me at the end of that straightaway. And everybody's seen the video. Yeah, just – yeah, and it was everything I, I had to hold back from not just ripping his head off. Yeah, right? how like, did you like, not? Well, because I, I was just thinking – Championship. Ch that's all I could think about was championship. I was thinking if I kick his ass – and I get dog, you know, like I lose it over that. Like I had to just sit there and control myself. And I just sat there, kept my bike running. Luckily, it stayed running because those things, once they were hot, they, yeah. they didn't want to fire. Yeah. Yeah. That was a crazy day. I'm glad I pulled it up. Because you imagine that story and I didn't win, though. <laughs> Dude, you were the guy that got oh. stooged by a lessee. <laughs> oh. That's another guy that you have to deal with. Like you, you have to deal with James. That was just like this freak show hype beast that came in. And then you had to deal with the believe the hype yeah, kid. Yeah, believe the hype. <laughs> dude, and that dude's a great starter, right? So he just, you had to deal with him all the time. He was fantastic. as a Like he was a fantastic rider. Really good outdoors. Supercross, not so much. What a enigma of a, like, 
uh, family, the way they grew up. Like, yeah. just it's see, like me, I could have never grown up in that. I would have said, I'm not doing like, I don't know, my personality, whatever you want to say. I, I don't think I would have done well in that. Mm. Where, like, I have a lot of self drive, but like somebody else telling you you have to do something, or mm. uh, I didn't, I don't do well with that. Yeah. Yeah. And they just grew up in like this kind of crazy. And I guess, like, the way that you grew up, it, it wasn't ever, I can't imagine your dad ever coming to you and be like, oh, I'm. If you don't win this moto, we no, can't pay rent. No. <laughs> Do you imagine that shit? I, I couldn't. Yeah, it'd be tough. Now, there's not many other sports where like that's even a remote possibility, right? No, it's it's, it's crazy. Yeah, that, it, like at 16, you and you, it, the whole family is riding on you, right? Like it's, yeah, it's a trip. Well, I don't I don't know like exact figures, but I mean, I feel like AC was probably making. Damn near a million dollars as sure, a fucking yeah. twelve year old. I'm sure it was up, up there, yeah. Like, what? What other? Sport? I feel like that's everybody's a little gun shy on doing those deals now, though, right? Yep. yep. But you don't. There's not. You won't grab that key guy if you don't. Sometimes, like. Well, I think you you talk about that whole like Mitch era, right? Like he, it was Team Green. They were they were obviously paying crazy bonuses like as team green back then. Mm -hmm. And then Mitch was like kind of where they ended up. I don't know how much of the money came from Mitch specifically. I think Cowie pays everything. Yeah. And then I think when like the Cowie, they stopped, maybe it was like the AC for once they stopped that. And then it was like star and Geico. Like they started, that's when you see. And it's like you said, you know, you just kind of like, you get, and if you don't have the talent, you don't have the talent. There's, There's, you know, you can't make up for that. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, there's no way that you're bridging that gap. No. But I mean, think it, you know, you think about the like the way Alessi grew up. It's like it didn't turn out for them. You know, like it's all it's, not like it's, it should it's, have. Or no, no, not, not should have. Not that it was supposed to. I guess. And like you think about the talent that he had. Like that year that was it Grant that took him out of Colorado when he had the broken kneecap. Yeah, yeah. fuck that was savage, bro. Right, <laughs> that was so savage. But like, dude, he was good that year though. I, he should have. He yeah. should have won. You know, and then the when he had that Bud's Creek uh, yeah. deal go down as was it or, Red Bud? Red Bud at the was, bottom of the hill. Yeah, yeah. It's like he was fantastic then too. It was like there was some kind of karma mm -hmm. or something where it was just like the mini bike career that they you know what i mean <laughs> you see yeah. some guys go the opposite way where it's like they just have like like villa you know like, like do you think there's a family out there that's that's doing it like that now I'm thick. Oh. like at the next generation like i mean i don't know like you see have you when was the last time you went to loretta's i went uh actually the last few years okay. i didn't go last year but it, Two years prior, I went, yeah. It was my first time this year. And you see such a spectrum. Like, there's thousands of families there, crazy. Yeah. And they're all in massive motorhomes. And it's like, you wonder how many people are, like, fully chasing the dream and, like, risking it all. Because it sounds like well, the way you grew up, it was like, it wasn't your dad's dream. No. But Just I think a, a lot of the kids, like a Tony Alessi, it's like, it was his dream as yeah. much as it was his kid's dream you know i think he's even said like i wanted to have two champion motocross like yeah it's like it's not even like he's shy about it but i think that's kind of the trouble that you run into is like when it's not, not yeah and especially when it doesn't work out and kid has you know didn't go to school has no education right like it, it's it's sad mm -hmm. it happens often yeah yeah and they might be the peak scenario for that like maybe that was, maybe that was the the cause for the to kind of mellow out a little bit in the in the am scene. Yeah, because like I wonder how much money they would have made as amateurs, because even they would have been cleaning up back then. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Fucking crazy. I wonder if it's still the, like that. Like, is there still guys making some amateur money? I'm sure, huh? I don't know, because you said the whole recession thing. Like that's that that's basically when I. I came here in 10. Okay, so right after. So it was right after, but it was still like, I remember JDR bought like basically MDK, just turnkey like for pennies on the dollar. Yeah. So, and everybody was gun shy to spend money and yeah. Yeah, it was like a, and I think that leveled shit out. 
in a way. It almost like it reset the landscape in a sense. Yeah, because money was really good before that. Yeah. Yeah, even in the last I, I class, still don't right? think it's gotten back to that. Yeah. Maybe it has now, but. Yeah, for a couple of guys in the lights class, probably. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, well, when, you bought a Bentley, didn't you? It, it Was it no, PC? No, I never had a Bentley. I had an Aston Martin for Aston a Aston Martin, yeah, okay. Yeah. Because yeah. 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 I remember, was it in like a trans world or something? Probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I like that. No, I, I've always had some, or no, I don't anymore, but yeah, I always love cars. So, What was the first one you got? First cool car? Yeah. Um. Uh, M3, a BMW M3, oh. yeah, like the old, yeah, it was a 03, I think. That was legit. Yeah, it was fun. I, I smoked the rear tires off of it in like two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd you go from there, car wise? No, uh, I had a few seven series BMWs, had that Aston Martin, some Range Rover, you know, kind of just everything. Yeah. Never know Lamborghinis or Ferraris. Yeah. Aston Martin was probably the most exotic I got. I feel like the Ferrari and Lambo thing is like they're kind of just more trouble than they're worth. Yeah, not not quite my style. I'm a little too too flashy. Yeah, yeah. Did you hear? Uh, I don't know if you heard on the Anderson podcast, but he was saying like riders should flex more. Like we have like, but it's it's kind of true, right? Like maybe it's because Moto is kind of like a little grassrootsy in a sense. Like kind of the demo doesn't really fit with it but yeah. like his his thing is like i just wish riders would flex more like so many dudes like have cool shit wear cool yeah. shit buy they're scared cool. to they're scared to like show it though but i think that, that comes down to i remember even when i had all people would give me shit i'm like dude like i like i like nice cars what's the deal you know yeah it's a fucking bummer eh? right it actually like i mean yeah, we we spoke about it a bunch but it's like Probably shouldn't really be a like have any kind of negative feelings around something that you've literally put your fucking life on the line for. It's like, yeah. and if this is the thing that I mean, even driving to the track in like a nice car, like I don't know, there's there's some kind of vibe that it does give you that, yeah. and it, and even it's like it's a signal of the success that you've had, and then it's almost like a motivation of the success that you would want to have in the future, in a sense. And like for me, I didn't buy those to to like be cool i just i enjoy nice cars right and yeah people get it twisted yeah if, or i guess if you bought it to be cool i guess that's that's your that's cool too yeah, yeah whatever you want to do right <laughs> yeah because yeah, i mean it fucking that, that works there's definitely there's definitely some girls that'll get in a, <laughs> that'll, that'll get in a nice yeah. car like it's a that's a thing too yeah yeah uh what was the what was the favorite bike you rode do you think I mean, the PC 250 was pretty dang good. As far as 450s go, I, I can't think of a bike where I was like, dude, that thing was good. <laughs> I don't know, like throughout my whole career, because I've asked, been asked this question before, and I'm, honestly, I, I really didn't care for any of the 450s I ever raced. What, what's it about them, do you think? Mm, I think they're, they're, just, they're hard to set up, you know, like, or I think myself too, I was looking for the perfect bike and that mm. that doesn't exist especially on the 450 side i feel 250 you, i don't know it, it must be the inertia or whatever like they handle better yeah and i i felt like i was trying to get a 450 to handle as good as a 250 i just don't think it's quite possible yeah and i don't know like for me i can't use like the smaller guy excuse because ricky and james are smaller dudes but like i think there's I, something to it man. i i don't know i i I had to. I felt like I had to have the perfect bike to even be on those close to those dudes level, you know. And it, I never kind of got there. Like, yeah, yeah. But I, in reality, I just wasn't as good as those guys. But um, I don't know. I, I didn't want to realize that at, at the time, right? You don't want. Well, you probably can't. They can't. Right? Like you have then, to think you're that motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think. That, well, if if you think if you think like that, that you're not going to beat them. It's impossible. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you think someone's better than you, you're not going to beat them. Yeah. Yeah, no, 100%. It's not going to happen. And I think there is something to this being smaller though. Like I don't I wonder how those guys made like made it happen. But I mean, you look now like I think the sport is trending bigger. Yeah. Like if I was a team manager in 2024, I'm starting to think more like a NBA draft guy. And I'm like, you kind of need to be 5'10". I mean, it helps. 
You could see, you could see it. Like, like Webb, Webb must be, he, that dude must be pretty strong. Yeah. You know? Cause you watch him. He's, he's, he's small on the smaller end. He gets, he gets the job done. Yeah. But you watch Jet. I mean, I know it's Jet. He, he's, you know, pretty cool to watch on dirt bike, but he's got more leverage. He's able to yeah. do things that smaller guys can't do. Yeah. And, and dude, it's leverage. Mm -hmm. Like that's all it is. And it's people fucking hate it when I say it, but like, when I started training in jiu-jitsu, it's all leverage. Yeah. You just literally figure that, like, because what you're doing is, like, you're you're basically, like, using your arms or legs as a lever. And it's, like, there's submissions that you do. Like, there's some things that, like, short people just literally can't do. Yeah. You don't have the, you don't you have don't, the leverage. You literally yeah. don't have, you don't have the grip. Like, you can't, there's, like, a, it's, like, a dust choke. So, like if if someone puts their arm like underneath you you can swoop under grab the back of their head and then you can literally put their head in this gap in your arms and then you close the space yeah and you can but if you can't get the all the way to where you can't yeah and like even if you get the grip but then yeah. like you're pulling on these small levers and you just can't get enough force yeah. on it you're not and, getting a tap out <laughs> no and then you think about like a triangle where you like put the dude basically do the same thing but with your legs like there's short guys that can't do the yeah. submission at all or like they just can't get the leverage on it when they do have it and it's when you see like mic micro differences in people's physiques in a sense to where and then you feel the difference you're like holy fuck this is all like if you apply that to a dirt bike like you think about if jet's on his toes and the length of his hip like yeah, just yeah. where his hip can get to where his toes can still be in the right spot that's so far back on the motorcycle compared to like even if you compare jet and hunter yeah you know and it's like because then you've got you got your foot peg and then you've got your shin your femur and then your hip and then your head essentially goes down over the handlebars so you've got this big spread of mm -hmm. like even weight distribution you could, and you could compensate a lot more yeah. both ways i think where your knee where your knee sits you know on the if it sits above the seat and you can you could pivot like a skier if that makes sense yeah yeah like i can't i'm on a big bike I, i'm not quite there I'm, I'm yeah my knee sits below that so if if you're above i feel like you can ride a bit different yeah stand yeah. standing up you can well i was gonna say i think it's like more it just leans more towards standing mm -hmm. then because yeah you can literally just like tip the where bike me i have to disconnect my knees a little bit to get if that makes sense yeah 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 and i just think nowadays it's so prevalent in the sport but it's weird that back more that oh four like oh five like oh six oh seven like we had tall dudes, but it just didn't maybe, translate. Yeah. I just I feel like it's something to do with the technique, to where it's almost like the new technique has like unlocked the potential of taller guys. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Because like, and I I'm a freak. I love the technique side of it, and I love to study it. And it's like I can see when I'm riding, I'm very tall, and I look tall on the like. I struggle to like get into that position where like my weight's very spread out like hip heads yeah 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 so it just feels unnatural uncomfortable awkward but so then to ride the way that i would ride which would be like an incorrect technique essentially i think being tall hurts me it's yeah, like very yeah. tip like the center of gravity is so much higher yeah, that might that might make sense yeah but yeah so i think over the years you've seen these trend of the technique has slowly changed and then the taller guys are able to then like use this new leverage and then they start setting up motorcycles like it and then tracks start develop you know mm -hmm. it's all it kind of just all these variables like force it to change in a sense yeah i would agree with you yeah and do you think like kitchen's tall ap's tall having a lot of success malcolm's tall yeah jet sexton you know, like we're starting to kind of see when it was. Yeah, in, I'd say Webb's probably the only kind of smaller dude that's kind of in that top tier, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you see where he can struggle, mm -hmm. and then you 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 clearly. But I will have see to say, it. he looks a lot better uh, this year in the whoops than he has in the past. Yeah, confidence wise, speed wise, just 
everything. Did you? Are, how actively are you watching stuff these days too? Yeah, quite. Like you're into yeah, it. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm totally yeah. into it. Yeah. So I watched a video that he put up the other day, uh, riding outdoors. Fuck, his bike looked good. I think, I think that bike looks. Yeah, it suits him well too. Whether mm. it's just for him or across the board, I, I would. I, wouldn't mind riding one just to see, but yeah, I was gonna say, have you ridden one? No, I have not. No, Dude, they're they're really good. No, it looks like watching it on track. It looks looks like it performs well. I love the story arc of that bike. Like the first time, 2010, mm-hmm. that thing sucked. <laughs> you know what I mean? For like so many people, Yamaha was like, "Nah, fucking airbox is staying up the top. The motor's backwards, and we're not changing it." And then it took. I think well, maybe 2022 was when that bike was like clearly the best 450. So it's like 12 years they yeah, stayed it's... committed to that bike. And it is. And a lot of this thing sucks along the way. Right. <laughs> it just sucked, dude. People would not. But I can't remember that. their 250. Did it come out with that design in 11 or was it even later? I think the 250 was like a couple of years was behind. It? Yeah. But that 250. Was it junk when it came no. out? I don't remember. It was good. Sick, dude. I remember riding one in 2019. I went to Townleys actually in New Zealand and I could not believe how good the bike was. Yeah. I'd never, it was just completely bone stock and I was, I'm, I'm a big 350 guy. So I've just been riding 350 since like 19. It is a fun and bike. So much fun. It's like a torquey 250, right? Like, yeah, just for dudes like me too. It's just the, it's yeah. kind of like the sweet spot. I'm actually getting more 450 inclined these days as I've done a lot more riding. I think I can like actually. Hand- I think the bikes have gotten better. The 450s, just the handling, have yeah. gotten lighter. Like they're not so, you know, big and. <laughs> like yeah. the, the 06 Suzuki or something, you know? Like. Yeah, yeah. They, they felt like. I would always say when I was when I was young and trying to ride four fifties, I'm like, I feel like I hit the brakes and the thing is fucking chasing me. Mm-hmm. Like it feels like the bike is behind me chasing me down. And I'm like, I want to be on top of the bike making it stop. That's why I, I was so anti four stroke. Like I was two stroke guy. Even when I signed my four fifty, you know, premier or whatever you want to call it, four fifty class deal, I I signed signed my Suzuki deal thinking two strokes. Really? Yeah. Because everybody in 05 rode two strokes. And I was, that that was what made my decision, was going to Suzuki. And then I started, I rode like a couple weeks on it. Same kind of deal I said with Mitch. We tested, rode both, and yeah, it was way faster on the 450. <sighs> but that off season, everybody was in that boat. Mm. And social media wasn't a thing yet. So like. Everybody was like, "Yeah, I'm riding a two stroke," but then you would hear them on, you know, yeah, crowd, like, we're off, yeah, we're you could hear them riding a four stroke. Yeah. In all the interviews, they were saying two stroke, and obviously everybody showed up on four strokes, except for MC might have rode a two stroke still, yeah, which was sick, yeah. well, which was cool for me to to actually race that dude. Uh, oh, dude! And because that was my first year, four fifty, and I mean, I grew up just you know that was my idol, so to be able to line up, yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah, well, what he San Diego got the whole shot, mm-hmm. does a knack knack over the triple, like dude, the king, right? He actually is the coolest dude, too. Dude, he's still like he'll still show up at the Cowie, you know, to do the photo shoots or stuff. The last few years, and dude, he'll still skim a set of whoops, hit a triple, like you know, just that once a year, just <laughs> yeah, it's a trip. He will show up at Glen Helen just on a random Thursday, like before World Vets. Yep, he was doing a bit of riding. I was like, fuck. He just How's he look- ride outdoors? I haven't seen him. So good. Really? Just smooth. Yeah, just yeah. looks like him. You well, could tell it's him. Just, oh, yeah. yeah. He's got that style. Man, Matt, there's one of the coolest motocross things of my life, actually. Went to Mammoth this year for the first time. And then he was riding whatever whatever class that it, it was. And he just gets in this full-blown battle yeah. with this local guy or whatever, you know. And he's out in front. And the guy has him covered. And it's like he's pushing, pushing. And Jeremy, you could just tell it was just, he was doing everything to like kind of keep him behind, keep him behind, keep him behind. And then he just, it's like he broke him, you know, yeah. put in that like one hot lap. <laughs> but you know, you come down the hill at Mammoth and then you've got that right hand bolt, the right hand bolt turn. And we're standing like right after the finish line. 
and you just see him come down and it's just 96 all over yeah, every yeah. time that he hit that ball turn dude he has that just, little head yeah, just, he has yeah. oh. i was just <laughs> like oh my god this is the dream right That's now funny. first time i'd ever like really hung out with him or yeah. anything no he's a, he's a rad dude for yeah he was always because i was a when i was on yamaha Tro, he was like bud light yamaha like running his own team so he'd be out the test tracks all the time and no, super cool dude. He would always come out of his way to like give me pointers or which a dude like he didn't have to do that, right? Like No, no. Genuine just a genuine good dude. Yeah. Well, when I when I met him, yeah, at Mammoth, where it was actually like Tyler Berriman's birthday. So we kind of just like got on the piss and yeah. we were having a dinner sort of party thing, golf simulator, or all just like golfing and having some beers and stuff. And I was just like, you know, some some of these say never meet your heroes. And I was like, I've had a few dudes that I've <laughs> yeah. met where I'm like, fuck, yeah, you're right. a dickhead. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I was kind of yeah. like worried a bit. And I was no, like, he's, uh, yeah, he's... Like, holy shit, you're the, actually the coolest guy. And then he did the podcast, coolest, coolest dude. Yeah. So it's like, it's pretty refreshing when you have a guy like that that mm -hmm. is as cool as, as that, you know? Uh, he changed the sport, man. He, 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 the sport was the most mainstream when, I don't know if that was just because timing of it or if it was him, but the sport was super mainstream when he was the guy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wonder what the ingredients are, you know, like I think. Does he, it seem like to you the sport was more mainstream then than now? Well, I mean, hard for me because I was in Australia then. Yeah, true. But like for me, it was huge then, you know, like I, I still, I still remember. Oh, I got to change the, switch that card over. I actually might just have a quick piss. If that's yeah, no worries. Good, good I'll do the same. Yeah. I'm going to do the same, actually. Dude, the guy that made LaCroix just murdered today. Yeah, he's crushing it, huh? I think oh, my wife, she, she loves finding, like, how much money in and out makes. How much money did you put? I don't know. Do you know what this guy's crushing? We just looked at it the other day. Like, the guy is murdering it, but I can't remember the stats. You know what's a crazy stat is, um, you know those Stanley Cups? Yeah. That yeah. all the chicks are going crazy Oh, yeah, over? my wife has, I don't know how many of them. So... <laughs> That company went from making 75 mil a year to 750 mil. <laughs> really? Because of those fucking cups. That's crazy. I didn't, wasn't I wasn't aware of them. It's just a tool company before, right? Is that yeah. what it is? Tools and Well, you know like in in Oz anyway, it's like Stanley knife. That's uh, what they call like yeah, yeah. a I don't, what are you box cutters? Yeah. So we just call it a Stanley knife. So <laughs> it's like a a GoPro. Yeah. So like that's that's how I knew it. And yeah, I had a friend, friend of ours, she rocked up at Supercross the other day and, and Anna straight away was just like, oh, you're one of those chicks yeah, that yeah, bought yeah. the Stanley Cup. She's like, I got this one, I got this one. I'm like, wow, I, I, missed yeah. the, I missed the memo. But yeah, I think the LaCroix dude's kind of like one of those guys that just made a complete yeah, that's killing off. Where are they from? Where are they out of? I think it is American. Really? American, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, so we're talking about MC. Mm-hmm. I think the sport was for sure the most mainstream then. I mean, I like my dad was into racing though. Like my yeah. dad raced and stuff like that. So we were like a moto kind of family, all his friends and shit. But McGrath was the king to me and I lived in Australia and the tiny town in the very north of the country that, yeah. you know. I feel like the average person would have known who Jeremy McGrath was walking down the street. Mm -hmm. But like nowadays, say – do you know who Tomac is or whatever? Like, probably not, right? I don't no. know. But I, I, but I feel like NASCAR, I don't know. Everything was a bit more mainstream, I felt like. Yeah, well, I wonder yeah. if it's like you have less options, right, back in the day. Yeah, true. In a sense. Now it's like you watch what you want to watch, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. I was thinking about it last night. We don't, like, I don't have a TV subs like a subscription. Yeah. I have YouTube Premium. And I'll watch football games and UFC on like streaming sites. Basically, if there's something I want to watch, like I'll just figure it out. It's not like you're flicking through the channels. Yeah. And I'll oh, check this out. Yeah. I guess that's not, doesn't happen these days. Not a thing. Yeah. Like we watch True Crime. We went on a two day YouTube bender of watching chimpanzees that fucked up their owners. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, <dude. laughs> Have you heard some stories? No. Oh my God. Really? So there's basically like, how, they, how, go, they go ape shit. How, yeah, how strong do you think a, an adult chimpanzee is compared to a human? Man, how, twice as strong. What, like five times really? as strong. Yeah. So they, 
there's like this whole thing. <laughs> Dude, it's like you can go deep on it, eh? But basically, so they're, they're pretty chill with their owners, right? So there was this one, there was this one like famous case where they basically like, they had this, this pet chimp and then it obviously got bigger and whatever. And they had a friend came over and she'd been around the chimp a bunch of times, but apparently she got a new haircut and had was like holding one of its toys and this thing just fucking snapped really? her. literally just like ripped her face off like they can they just rip arms like they're so, so there's strong. no no contest no, you can't even no done like they can literally just they grab Dude, you they look so just mellow too right like <laughs> it's crazy bro so and then there was this there's another one this one's fucking gnarly i'll actually text it to you after this he basically the the whole story was what you basically got to be a weird person to own a chimp. So I think all the stories of it are kind of weird. Yeah. But basically, this guy is like in the military. He's in Tanzania or some shit. There's this chimpanzee that is orphaned. He takes a chimpanzee, figures out how to get it back to America, raises this chimp like it's his own. I think it had like one issue where... a fr- Same thing. A friend came over, put their finger in its cage, and it literally just went... And ripped his, really? ripped, ripped the chick's finger <laughs> off, right? So then uh, that had like a bunch of complaints or whatever about this chimp. So then they had to move it to like a facility outside of town where like all these other chimps were. So anyway, they'd go and visit this chimp all the time. So they went, they go and visit this thing, and then the owner of the facility like left the gate open on a couple of these chimps. And then you just see this big motherfucker just walking down, just Shit. squares up with the, the owner. And then dude, like thumbs in his eyes, like gouges the dude's eyes out, like bit really? his face off, ripped his nuts off. Just like they are fucking <laughs> hectic. <laughs> so anyway. I'm, I'm, I'm out, dude. Yeah. Dude, straight. I'm straight. Out. You should not own a chimp. But it's like, that's what we watch these days. Yeah. You know, there's no 10 channel. When I grew up in Australia, we had three TV channels, mm-hmm. four we had a company called S- a channel called SBS, which was basically like the government. They had like a free channel for it was just free on every single TV in Australia, right? Four channels, and then you'd go, you'd sit on the couch, you go one, yeah, two, yeah, three, yeah. four, and then you go. And then you'd be outside. You go, go fuck it. <laughs> like there's not, there's nothing on. And then you'd we watched like the Dakar Rally that was on SBS. That was pretty cool. I grew up watching MotoGP cool. and yeah. Formula One, and that's that's pretty much what you had, right? So I think to go all the way back to the McGrath thing. It's like we're just in an era where you didn't have as much choice yeah. and you didn't like, we just, well, we don't even watch it on a TV. Like we'll literally just eat dinner at our like kitchen servery kind of thing and we'll just watch YouTube on a phone. Yeah. You know, right. we've just, we've changed so much. So I think you had this perfect figure in Jeremy McGrath that was perfect for the sport he was amazing at the sport. He was amazing at promoting the sport and promoting himself. And I think like he was like being himself and people loved him. Yeah, yeah they, you could know? See, they could see that, yeah. And I think, and that's sometimes what I think with like James. Like why didn't James change the sport? Mm-hmm. Because he should have. You know, he was so fucking good. Right. And it's like, you if you've ever watched Bub as well, like he's a quirky, yeah, kind of like a quirky odd dude in a sense not in a bad way at all he's a funny dude yeah but he's like he's got his own vibe he's making it like and that problem like him being himself is an equivalent to like mcgrath being himself like just by mcgrath being himself everyone loved it added to the whole and i think with james maybe a little different people didn't like him as much and then he ends up kind of like just doing his own thing Ricky probably didn't give a fuck about any of it. No. He was just there to be the most psycho savage dude yep. ever. So it's like he's not going to change. So you had the perfect guy at the perfect no. time. Yeah, yeah, and then sure. you get into like the social media and everyone's like, no, nah, I just want to watch cat videos all day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah, I just think that that's the way that it goes. And I really, I think Deegan will be the one. It could be, yeah. Yeah, I think he'll be the one that he's got this crazy following. He's like, they got the right amount of like 
flex in a way because it's like all they've ever known. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like he's not going to feel bad of it. He, he's only ever worn Gucci t shirts. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. He's like, well, t shirt would I wear? <laughs> so I think, yeah, he might be kind yeah. of the guy. I thought, I really, Jet, the jury's out because I feel like the. You think he'll shut down at one point, some point and just be that's like, that's maybe, you know, yeah. like yeah. just go to just win races and not show that side of yourself. Yeah. yeah, or maybe win five in a row, and something crazy, and then just be like, "I ain't gonna fucking try and ride Formula, I'll drive Formula One, yeah. or I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a movie star, I'm gonna be like, yeah, you never know, right? What do you make of the Jet Lawrence effect over the last couple of years? Um, I mean, there is a lot of hype, but it, but dude, the kid's great on a dirt bike, <laughs> like it's it's pretty pretty unreal to watch, right? So I don't, I don't really know where, like, I get tired of hearing about it, but at the same time, who else are we going to talk about? Yeah. Dude, it's funny. I had a, I had a guy. I've obviously been very pro Jet. For... I've been surprised Hunter hasn't been better. Honestly, on, Honestly. Too. Like, yeah. I was thinking maybe he would, yeah, been right up in the mix with his brother, but. Well, look at how he rode in Paris. Yeah. See, I didn't watch any of that. He was ripping. Was he? We beat Jet in a race. Yeah. And it, I'm, I know he hadn't been on the bike that long. Did he get injured or anything during the off season? Not sure. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, he hasn't been bad. I, I, I just, I think I was expecting more maybe. Yeah. Well, I think I would, I would have to think that it would be quite hard. For, it would have been a hard season thus far for Hunter, right? So A1 has a bit, he has a pretty big crash at press day. True. Yeah. And then Jet goes out and, and well, then doesn't make the main. Got fully cleaned out by Vince. And then, I don't know, like, the LCQ, the first three laps, he just didn't, he yeah. just wasn't riding fast in that. But maybe he was thinking he had a bit more time than he did. Maybe he's trying to be a bit too careful, like, no, whatever. Yep. Doesn't make the main there. Round two, crazy mutter. Round three, crazy mutter. Round four, triple crown. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. it's like... He hasn't got no build, no momentum. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's just one of those like. Well, he got he got fifth at the last. Yeah. yeah, I did see that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good ride. Yeah. So I think that it's like I think his season on paper has been like fucking dog shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But like as far as him riding, like I I feel like he's actually been very fast on the bike, especially like testing and practicing and stuff yeah. like that. But. Yeah, just what like a crazy weird season thus yeah. far. So, you know, when you add in the triple crowns and all that sort of shit, and then I wonder, I wonder how it feels to like. Surely he feels the emotions that his brother feels too, right? You know, so like Jets fucking <laughs> just yeah. high low, high low, and then the fan zone and like that they've taken on a lot. That is a lot. You yeah, know? I wouldn't have wanted all that when I was racing. I'll be honest. Mm. It's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's, I think it's like a under, it's an underappreciated fact in the sport is it's like, we always talk about like, oh, we're going to change the sport. We're going to grow the sport. Like you've actually got two guys that are trying. Yeah. Yeah. Like they've, and that, that for takes, better or worse. Uh, they don't have to. And that, that uh, takes a lot of energy, right? To do that. I mean, that, or not a lot. That takes energy to do that. You could just go show up, race, make your money and be out. Right. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. And no one, and that's the route that people do take for the most part. It's like part. That's of, the route I took. I wouldn't have probably done all that. To be honest with you. Yeah. Well, I, think, I never got to the level where I could do any of that, if that makes sense. But I don't know if I would have wanted to. Yeah. But how? When did social media become a thing for the sport? Was it just a thing that you never really like? Kind of. As you were finishing four fifties, like people started talking about it, but because I imagine for the majority of your career, it just wasn't even really a thing. It wasn't at all. No, maybe, maybe the last year I raced. You know, that was, that's about it. Yeah, before that, it wasn't just like a whole different, a whole different deal. Well, how was the media then back then? Like, what was your take on like the media in moto? I just they just ask the same questions every week. You know, it's just. It wasn't, yeah. I think it could be better. Mm. What What would you change in that? Or like, what would you have wished it was like when you were racing? Because you're cool as fuck. <laughs> like, you're actually cool, I, guy, I you know? I feel like, I don't know, I, I wish, it seems so cookie cutter, everything. And 
felt like you had the pressure to kind of be a, be that way, mm. especially early, like when I first, like earlier 2000s, I felt like it was way more of that tuck your shirt in, no tattoo, you know, mm. that, like you were, you, they used to have, you know, they'd tell you what, basically like what you could look like. I feel like, I don't know. I think that, that that's changed. Obviously you could be who you want to be now, right? Like I, I, I don't know. And I think I was gun shy to show my true colors. Mm. That makes sense. What would you like? Let's say you could have just open slather. You could have just done and said, "Been who you wanted to be." Like, what would you have been like? What would you have done different? In a sense, I don't know. I mean, saying that, I I guess I'm I'm a pretty to myself person, you know. Yeah. Like, so I probably wouldn't have changed anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. You know, but I, I'm a different person away from it. You know, like yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, but like, I, I wish we got to see a bit more. Cause like I said, yeah. you're, you're a cool fucking guy, you know. It's like you, it's you don't have to be this like loud, over the top, like showman kind of guy. Like just to even, like, dude, when I go to the, I've been loving going to the press conferences. Like I'm trying to get, I'm more just trying right. to get like emotion out of guy. Yeah. Like I, it, what I'm asking, who cares? Like, just give me some fuck. Give me a fucking vibe, boys. No, you know? Not a list of your sponsors. and Yeah, and it's like, I w- I'm so down for them to just be like, dude, that's a fucking stupid question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would actually love that. And yeah. I feel like that's probably like, that probably would have been more your vibe. Like, you wouldn't have been trying to like, be the no, out there no. over the top guy, yeah. but you would have just been at a press conference and be like, yeah. Dude, shut up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, but, plenty, of, plenty of times I would have wanted to do that, yeah. But that to me is, pers- like, that's you being you. Yeah. You know, and then there's guys like AP that they're the other direction. So I'm like, let everyone, like, be the, be the everyone sense, do yeah. what. If you just want to be the guy that just says, like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> do it. Like, that's yeah. that's yeah. actually cool. Like, like uh, Bill, you probably, Bill Belichick or something. Like, yeah. Yeah. The, there was uh, Cole Davies. He won the Futures at A2. And that, like, he's trained with Townley. For, I know, like, yeah, yeah, I yeah. know so much about him. And what, so I just loaded up this question with him where I'm <laughs> like, you could, you could talk about any of this, bro. And he literally just went, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Huh? And I'm like, that's fucking brilliant. Like, that's better than if you actually answered the question. <laughs> but I, I feel like maybe guys are starting to. You know, but no, I, it seems like dudes are loosening up. But I even, I mean, I've, I've I actually DM the boys like a couple of them before the press conference the other day, and I'm like, let's fucking go. Yeah, let's do it. Let's go. Talk shit on me. Tell me I'm a dickhead. Like, are they into it or no? I think they're all scared. Yeah. They're all just a little bit. They're all just a little bit scared. Probably for the same reasons I was like, you just, I don't know. You yeah. Know, you but, hold back. Yeah. But what's gonna happen? Nothing. And I think that that's the. I think that's the perspective they don't have in a sense is like, I should be proof enough to everybody that you can do and say whatever the <laughs> fuck you want and actually be like, yeah. I mean, <laughs> like for some reason it fucking worked out, you know, and I'm, I'm not ticking any of the right. Does boxes, anybody but... at the press conference hold back or do they let it ride? Um, I mean, I feel like I mean AP is pretty good in there, dude. Coop, like the A, uh, the San Diego press conference was dope. Coop was in there, AP was in there, Basha was in there. Like the boys, yeah, were, you got some good personalities there. Yeah, they were they've kind of were letting it go a bit. And then at the end, which I actually thought was super cool, Coop, um, the press conference was done, and then he was like, "Hey, I just want to say something," and he was like, "I remember AP's first day on Supercross." And it was not good. Yeah. <laughs> he was bad. So to see him here, and he gave like a real, you know, like genuine, loving kind of yeah. um, response to a, just fully off the cuff, you know, like just said it off his own. And that to me, I'm like, no, that's it's pretty rad, cool to see know? the the love AP got from everybody. Right. Like pretty much everybody was high five. You know, that's cool. That show, he's a good dude. Everybody, yeah. he's, he's cool to everybody. He's, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, he he's an example i think of like did you watch phoenix yeah see his reaction when he won that heat race the crowd yeah bro yeah. like you couldn't have done that shit any better you know and i i just i've had so i had like um I, you know bill savino at honda yeah 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 
So he's a fucking legend. So we we talk a bunch, and he was he's fully like I want I want that personality. Like we you don't need to mention this this and this and this. Like it's just I think people have this false. It's like a false narrative, maybe that like if I'm on there, I have to say this, this, and this, and if I don't, oh, there's going to be some consequences. When you just rattle off your spot, no one's listening to that, anyways, right? Yeah, no one hears it. But I think there's yeah, prob- if you show some personality and yeah. yeah, but like look at what you you get thirty seconds to make an impact on people. You know that like you wear a sport with helmets on, so it's like people don't even get to see yeah, true who yeah. you are. You know. I personally think that there should be, it shouldn't be until the 30 second board or like the chick walks across the start line that you're even allowed to put your helmets on. That way people could recognize you. And yeah, yep. yeah. So I think how it should go on the broadcast is they have helmets off completely, not allowed to have any helmets on and you've got to sit on the start line, you do your prep, all that, that whole that whole pre-game, which there's probably a lot of guys where they feel like more safe. They feel like they kind of go into. There's probably a lot of guys that wouldn't like it. Yeah, because they, you they put your want, helmet on. You, you yeah. kind of like in your bubble and. Yeah. yeah. So I think that there'd be riders that wouldn't like it, but I, imagine for the TV coverage when you're zoomed in and it's like you can see AP. You know, maybe he keeps his cowboy hat on yeah, yeah. for the whole time until they put the helmets well, on. That's what pe- people want to know the person. Yeah. 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 And I think that when you get that 30 seconds on TV, if you win a heat race or you win a, a main event, that's it. That's all you got. Yeah. You get this tiny, tiny, tiny window to win the hearts of fans over. And then if you're in the press conference, then that's your time. I think the press conference, we need to get away from talking about the race at the press. Like we fucking watched the race. Like your bike was good. You won the mm-hmm. race. I don't give a fuck if you change two clickers of in between. Like, cool. Tell me what you think about the sport as a guy that has reached the pinnacle. Like yeah. you're on this, you you have a microphone and you have this platform because you're one of the guys. Like, I would like to know what you think about the sport. How could it be better? You know, just give me some story. Give me Give me something as a fan to like, just give me more, you know? So I think it's just, have you been asking those questions? Try it. Yeah. They've been answering them pretty. Yeah. So we had one clip was pretty solid. Um, when I asked about like in-ear communication, like if it was after San Diego, there was a lot of lappers and stuff, which obviously is just part of the sport. But I'm, I would be a massive fan of if riders had earpeat, like in-ears and you could have the team talking to the rider, the rider talking back to the team. You'd have to be very selective. I don't think it wouldn't be like an open season, like yelling at each other and shit. Yeah. Like, be professional, like F one. But dude, think about what that would do for like just the broadcast, mm. the, re- the through the week. Imagine if we caught all the audio of Jet and Ando. Imagine if you catch the audio of like AP and his mechanic. Like we just yeah the sport we just see what you see on TV as a fan is just like silence of mm. dudes <laughs> hugging each other you know like it's yeah, yeah. We, it's not very well covered in a sense so I, I asked about that and all the boys kind of like weighed in their opinions on it which i think was cool and even just for safety like imagine you've safety, got safety i think yeah got a down rider and it's like even if it's just race control mm-hmm. that's like rider down triple red flag on this triple it's like race is red flagged like whatever it is i tried it during the Rick, Ricky, when I was training with Ricky at his place, when he was going through the NASCAR oh. phase, he, he put one in my helmet during the week, and I, I I think I did one session. I ripped it right out. I'm like, dude, I can't listen. He was, but yeah, he was talking too much. Like, oh, he would have been railing you, bro. Oh, dude, yes. Yeah. I, I took. I was like, ah, there's no way. What was he saying? Oh, tell me, yeah, everything. I saw, yeah, whatever. <laughs> what the fuck was that? During the- <laughs> Just talking, you know, like. Uh, no, don't work. Yeah, but there, there's... but if you had at uh, the race, if you had somebody just giving you instead of what's on your pit board, you know, just count your lap time, what place you're in. Hey, there's a down rider. Hey, this guy's jumping this. Yeah, just little. You don't need more than that, right? No, nah, but think about how much of a difference that'd make. Huge. It'd be sick. Like, I, I, imagine if you're you're even if like the points that, like at motocross the nations. Yeah, they could have said, hey, you just stay where you're at. You don't need to take any more chances, right? Yeah. 
when where I was just <laughs> full tilt, could have ate shit that last lap. <laughs> Had no idea. Just fully risking it. Yeah, so I mean that yeah, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of stuff that I think could just like easily just lift the yeah. sport in a way, you know. But I think it's getting better. Like I I think for me, Levi Kitchen's probably like one of the guys that I think could be a bit of a star in the lights class. Yeah. No, for sure. You know, like I think it, it this is my storyline mind going crazy with Levi, right? So I don't give a fuck what he says. He left Star because he was sick of the Deacons. All yeah, right. Yeah. Let's just someone say it. Someone from the camp just say it. Because <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. Like I get it. So I I feel like Levi could fully use that. And just be like, left because of the Degans. Yeah, yeah. It's not my vibe. If they're not your vibe, rock with me. <laughs> because for sure. he could literally, for all of the people that love Hayden Degan, there's a whole lot of people that can't stand Hayden Degan. Yeah, they would jump right on board. Just yeah. be the fucking Levi. Like, hey, Levi, you plant the flag in the ground, give people a team to cheer for, and you just have captured half of the sport. Yeah. You know, so it's like, I think it's just guys maybe not wanting to rock the boat or not, you know. Yeah. But then I think there's the other thing as an athlete where there's a certain level of like mental strength that it takes to deal with calling your shot. You know, like you hear like a, a McGregor, oh, I'll fucking start him in round one, mm, yeah. bounces out off the canvas. That's fucking hectic. <laughs> then because like, then you, you've you got, have to, yeah. you have to deliver it. Yeah. So it's like as a, as a writer, you know, talking shit, and I think that's why you don't ever hear writers pre- you know, say, oh, I'm a freaking waxer, but, you know, you just don't, you, you don't hear it very, right? Because then you got to go out and do it. Yeah. <laughs> what What would you have loved to see changed back then? <sighs> what, that's like just the easy thing where you were just like, man, if you guys just did this, fuck it, make it better. I I, I noticed a big change in the tracks. 04 to 05 easier and, mm. I, and I still think I don't know I still think they're so cookie cutter the tracks it's the mm. same exact obstacle and the guys during the week have the same exact you know I mean it's just cookie cutter I don't know there for a few years they would build some different obstacle you know obstacles and yep. bigger you know big jumps big quads I'm not talking quad rhythms like quad 80 foot like the fans would love they love that stuff yeah it looks cooler yeah um, I don't know. Tracks are too cookie cutter to me. Boring, boring to watch. Yeah, I completely agree. You remember like oh four, oh three, oh four when they'd have those like, like what the fuck were they? Yeah, like just different. <laughs> what, were they? Yeah. Or, or what do we call those things? Like you ain't building that at the test track to prepare no. for it. It's just like on that day you got to figure it out, right? Yeah. And some people wouldn't like that because they want they want the. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think. Maybe that's another thing too is the the sport, it's a kind of weird dynamic and it's it's works great in the sense that you've got this manufacturers that invest. Like think about Supercross Pit. Like Feld just puts on the event and then $100 million worth of shit yeah. just fucking rocks up. They don't pay for any of that. So it's like there's a really weird balancing act and some give and some take yeah. that takes place to make that work. And so how many times is Like ro- say the, the rule was it you can only have nine whoops or whatever that they like who where does that come from? Is that a is that an actual rule? I saw it, I don't know, I saw that on social I don't know if it's for real or not, but like who's making those calls? I don't know. That's... Or I don't know, or when they mow the whoops down because some guys can't get through them, it's just like, dude. That could change the outcome of the night. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, I, and I'm, I'm with you massive on the, on the tracks, but I think that like there have, there would have had to be conversation. And I know that would have gone down where it was like, Hey, let's, let's make the tracks more like the, the test tracks. We've got the, you know, we've spent all this money to have the, you know, so it's like, there's yeah. got to be some high up teams that are, that have a level of influence and, no, I don't think we should change that rule. I think we need to keep this rule here to, you know. Mm-hmm. So I think that when you're in, it's like the sport 
doesn't have the ultimate control in a sense. Like you think of Formula One, like they're paying per point. Like if you get a point, you get this much money. They like build all the budget. Like so the F1 can do whatever they want. We mm-hmm. want to change the rules, change the rules and deal with it. Whereas and it's funny, you talk to guys like Bill at Honda and he's like, man, we would struggle if they made an open season. Like works bikes and all. Yeah. That's what killed super bikes in the US is they wanted to go to this like MotoGP style thing. And it's like, we're fucking footing the bill. So it's like, it gets hard. Yeah, that, it, gets yeah. real, it gets real hard if you want to just go like open slather. And so as a fan, you're like, oh, I kind of want to see that. But then when you realize like the behind the scenes of it. So that's what I mean is, is I think you've just, we're, there's this weird dance between like the manufacturers mm-hmm. and the sponsors and the, and then even, oh, monster, like, oh, we don't want this here and it's got to be this. And, oh, you run this exhaust pipe and you're trying to make a drink. And well, yeah. now we, you know, so I think that it's kind of just messy in a sense. I'm sure. Yeah. To where there probably can't be as much change as we'd like, you know. Yeah. Outside the tracks, was there anything else? Mm, not really, man. Like, as far as the sport, mm. no, I can't complain. I, I think for the most part, they do a good job. You know, I think everything's, yeah, no complaints. I, I nothing I can think of. Yeah, yeah. No, I would definitely agree. I think that they could make the tracks a little more just different. Especially, I mean. I almost feel like the tracks in some ways are easier now than they were some of them 20 years ago. And the equipment is so much better. So much better. Like they could, could handle it and the technique and the, you know what I mean? Like the riders in themselves are just yeah a, a level above. And what about the bikes? Cause I feel like that's one of the biggest points of contention is that like they're too fast. They're too fast for the stadiums. Like, did you, were you a one press day by any chance? I didn't go to press day. No, bro. Jet jumped. Oh, I saw that. Five. Yeah. <laughs> five jumps. Granted that maybe the landing was a time, but it's like, bro, yeah, it was still, yeah. Greased it. Like, that's fucking crap. That's half a rhythm section. Yeah, you weren't doing that 10 years ago, 20 years ago, especially not. So it's like, should we move or like, do you, you know? The spacing or. Well, just even the displacement. Like, oh, are, you're saying this. Yeah. Are they I think they, I they, think they overshot the, I think they overshot the displacement, in my opinion. Especially after racing that 350, that you don't need more than that. Mm. Four, you know what I mean? Like, and it would make for better racing, for sure. Like you watch the 250, 250 on a compared to a 450, it's more exciting to watch, right? Yeah. Just think if you had Tomac, Jet, all those guys on smaller bikes, like the premier guys. Yeah. Like how it would be cool. Oh, dude! Can you unreal. imagine the sound of Tomac riding a 350? Yeah. The thing would fucking scream, yeah. bro. Yeah, if you had all those guys on small, it, it would be cooler to watch, I think. Yeah. But, I mean, you say they decided to do that, like how long would, what would the process of that be? Mm. If they decided, would that be a five, hey, five years from now we're going to go smaller? Like how many years would they need? I mean. If they did ever change it, they're not going to, but. Yeah. It's one of those, um, it's one of those, it's like a vampire decision, you know, like once you decide to become a vampire, you can't yeah. not be a vampire again. So it almost seems like that, you know, they, they kind of, I guess you just, when you, well, you were there for the first era, it's like, did you realize that they could be this much better? Like a 250 two stroke compared to a 450. Yeah, it's not even, yeah, it's not even comparable. <laughs> yeah. It was supposed, that was the idea. What was that one Doug Henry race? Was it a 400? 400. Yeah. Maybe that would have been. A, Maybe, eh? I don't know. Maybe that would have been the, been the move. But even I, I wish that they would let 252 strokes ride the lights class. Yeah, that would be cool. They do it all over the world. Amateur racing and everything, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's guys, there's, there's privateer dudes in Australia that won the, like, the lights class championship on a 252 stroke got factory rides yeah because you see that one guy shows up and tries to qualify for the 450 class on it and he's, dude it's so slow compared to, no it makes sense 250 it's not that much faster right i don't think so i mean and it, it's like it'd probably just be like give and take and stuff you know but i could see i could see a world where that makes sense and i think it would make sense it would make 
more like everyone wants to talk about the privateer privateer but like you could just have a dude that could go racing like yeah. on his own mm-hmm. th- and be a pre- lot more competitive may- possibly oh you'd, you'd have to think that there'd be some like fringe guys like guys that are like kind of on the cusp you know but you'd have to be a better writer yeah i'm not so, mad at that though yeah because those those things aren't easy to ride right yeah <laughs> What's the so in 06, did you test the the two fifty two stroke? I did, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I tested an um actually Honda Honda flew me up in a helicopter up to Castillo Ranch. That was probably one of the coolest experiences. Really? They were like meet meet us at Chino Airport or whatever. We're gonna go up like so no one could see me. So I got to fly fly in a helicopter from LA to or from Chino to Castillo Ranch, lander landed right at the track. Got to ride a two, uh, you know, works Honda two fifty for the day. Pretty sick. <laughs> that would have been. But they low, they low, ended up lowballing me. Oh, really? Yes. And then uh, Suzuki, Suzuki's offer was really good. And um, I don't know, Roger, Roger, I, like they, he really, the meetings I had, he really believed in, you know, the conversations. He, so that's what brought, you know, drew me towards signing that deal. What was the like the how big of a difference was the paycheck? I think uh, like four hundred grand or something. Fuck, it's a lot. Yeah, it's cool. You really can't. Plus, for me, it was like I, I didn't think Honda was that much better than Suzuki or at the time. You know, I was just, yeah. And I was in my head, I, I wanted to surround my people, surround myself with people that like believed in me. Like, yeah, we want to sign this guy. We think this guy can win. Where I felt like Honda was like, yeah, we're Honda, kind of, you know. We don't, we don't care if you sign it. You know, it'd be cool if you did. <laughs> you know, that kind of attitude. Like, yeah. So, I don't know. That That's what that's where that decision was made. It, I mean, money came into play, obviously, too. But yeah, I, mean, I wanted to be somewhere where they believed in me and they you know, wanted me there. Yeah. How cool was it getting to work with Roger? Like, is it the experience that you would think from the outside? Roger? Yeah. Probably similar to what you would think. Yeah. Like, when I was the first year... I got fourth in the series, you know, behind Ricky, James, and Chad. Didn't you get hurt at the start of the year, or was that the next year? That was the next year. Okay. Was it like a ankle or a No, wrist? so we did those Canadian rounds, Yeah. Um, and Stuart, in practice, landed on me, landed yeah. on my hand, and just destroyed yeah. my hand, <clears throat> which sucked, because that dude, I had a great off-season that year. I even ask, if you asked Ricky, like, best I, best I was was those couple months, but I never really got to show it. I, I got... Got landed on it, Toronto, and then it was I think five weeks from there till A A one, and I destroyed my hand like every bone in my hand. So I I decided to to show up at A one like I was like I rode once, basically taped my hand to the bars. And I, I went and rode once and I was like yeah I will pull it. Shouldn't have been there. I don't know what I was thinking. You just wanted it. Yeah, and I I I was like I got to start the season. You know just so. I don't know, just my, and then I was, I don't know, just my confidence, because I wasn't, I only rode once, right? My hand was still broke, so I wasn't doing that great. I still ended up fifth in the series, which wasn't. That's good, dude. But my confidence, because I, I was, I was going to be, I wanted to be a podium guy, win races, and fifth, that that sucked, right? So I don't know, my confidence kind of just, then Roger kind of lost faith in me mid-season, can you tell a switch like you can? Oh, one hundred percent. What what with him. what made you think that? With him, yeah. I, I feel like he he just he'll he'll just give up on you. Mm. I don't say he gives up. Like he just he, and I, I know where it happened with him. Like it, it was Seattle Supercross. <clears throat> I had been struggling. I you know hadn't been on the podium all year. I don't think. But I whole shot the main and. I, a rock got stuck in my rear brake, like so my bike just stalled and stopped. You know, and like I'm sitting there, like, dude, what the, what what just happened? Figured it out, finished the race. I don't know what I got. By that time, by the time I got going, I was in last. You know, one of those situations. So I get back to the truck and like nobody's there. And I'm like, dude, where where's everybody at? And I was, truck driver's the only guy there. He's like, oh, they all left, or he said they all left after you gave up, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> I'm like gave up, what you guys, and. Yeah, and f- fully he he thought I whole shot the race, and just just stopped and gave up. I'm like, I got a rock. St-, you know, That's later insane. we had a meeting. And I'm like, dude, how do you guys think that I did that? Like, 
No, that that pissed me off though. I was I was so pissed. Like, dude, you, you guys can't. You guys yeah. are gone. You guys go back to the hotel. You're not even here. That is hectic. Yeah, that's when I quickly realized. All right, I gotta. I'm I'm out. I'm I'm not gonna get a gig here again. Probably. Yeah. It's, and that's when I went to Honda. Yeah. That stuff. That, and Suzuki still gave me an offer, but you know, like I was saying before, I wanted to be around people yeah. that believed in me. Like, dude, you're our guy. And at the time, Kehoe was calling me. You know, like he, for whatever reason, believed in me. So he was the one that. And that's why I went to Honda after that. Yeah, the the mental game is so underrated. Like the mental game that you have to play to like stay in it. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like the. I think Hunter's a really good example of this. Of he was killing it in Europe, and then you get to America and you have an injury. And then you have an injury and you have an injury and then people start losing faith. People start losing faith. People start, uh, they make all these excuses like why you're not that guy. And it's like the power of compounding. Mm -hmm. Like you need years on years on years of just like no injuries, good yeah. momentum, good like, and you were the guy that built yourself up from nothing, you know? So I feel like you would have had such a good perspective on like, the grind that it takes to like get to get yourself to like the peak, you know, yeah. and then to be in the middle of that process and like know where you're at and know what you've got to do. And then you just have people kind of dip out on you. Like, fuck, that must be hard to go through. Yeah. No, that's what I saying. Like it, that was, that was tough. Yeah. I can't, I can't, <laughs> I can't imagine what it would have been like to have to live through it, you know, and especially like to, to have, so much success and like start you started from the bottom you know like essentially a privateer yeah, kind of Honda 100%. team and like to get to the level that you got to it, it's the crazy crazy journey of just like pushing and pushing and 100%, pushing. that's all it was yeah 100 percent. How, how do you so like i'm saying that like any kids out there like dude grind it out yeah. right yeah if you if you're not if you don't have the talent, you gotta recognize who you are. If you don't have the talent, you gotta make up with it somewhat. Like you could work, you could always work, right? Mm. There's one thing you could control. Yes, yeah. how hard your effort and how much work you put in. Yeah, and I think for you, you're a guy where it's like I I would say you maximized your talent. I would say so. Like no you, no regrets on my like people ask me like like any regrets? Mm. No, not at all. Now, and I wouldn't say that's probably common. I'm sure a lot of guys have regrets. Yeah, and you genuinely like... I really don't. So I mean, sick. yeah, was there lessons learned along the way? Yeah, was there things you yeah. could have done better? Y yes, of course. But would I have done it differently? No. Yeah. No, I could honestly say that, no. That must be a good feeling. Yeah. Because there is circumstances that are like obviously out of your control or decisions that like you wish you would have made different, but at the time you can't make a different decision. No, right? exactly. It's all hindsight. Yeah. It's easy to admit. Yeah. What was your perspective on that as when you were going through that process of like maximizing your talent? Mm. In my head, I was as good as anybody. Maybe that was, you know, manufactured in my head. Like there was, there was never, I can't say that. Like, Racing against James, you, you have to be really stupid to think you're as fast as that guy, right? Anybody else, that really, no one was better than me, in my head. Whether that was manufactured or not, like, I truly believed that. And I think that's what got me as far as I got. Yeah, and I guess it's like, if you live like that, if you live that, like, no one. And that's not like a cocky, like, um, like it was, it was a true, and I didn't. It's not like I say it out loud. It's just like deep down inside that true, like, yeah. But I think that there's a way to say it. Like, I understand fully the, like, that there's not, that's not a cocky thing to say. It's almost like a, you're not putting a ceiling on yourself in a sense to where it's like, all right, because so for me, when I was racing, I was like, I'm not talented. I'm not fast. I'm not good. I don't have good, but like, so you'd put was, a ceiling, you'd put yeah, a ceiling yeah, I put there. a ceiling on myself. And I was, I, and I'd never achieved anything great in my life. So I never had any reference mm -hmm. to go off. 
I was just like, oh, you're just not good. And then I've got my brother who was way better. And I'm like, oh, yeah, he's way better. Like, that's he's talented. I'm not talented. And I'm not saying I could have been a – this is not me saying I could have been a pro motocross rider. Yeah, yeah. But it's like then I get to this or my film career. I didn't put a ceiling on myself at all. And I had that same thought. Like, I could be – as good as anybody yeah. in doing this. So it's like, yeah, that it's that belief in a sense where it's not, you're not cocky. You don't think you're already there. But it's genuine. Yeah. Like it's, you're not, man, you're not lying to yourself, right? Maybe you are, but. Yeah, but you're, you're acknowledging your potential in a sense. And then you're living in accordance to that potential or like what, because so like, especially doing this as this started getting more and more successful right and i'd think about why and i just feel like i started showing like whatever the next thing that i had to do to reach whatever like the next step there's like a thing you just have to get out of bed Mm -hmm. and then there's like a road map in front of you you have an idea of like well if i do this 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 and this this will happen so you end up to be successful in your life you end up just having to do the daily task that would lead to success right Mm -hmm. and so it's like it's just this very small incremental process and then as i got a bit further down the road and like the ambitions get bigger you just like all right well fuck this is what i'm gonna have to do yeah and then you just you just start do it clicking off the laps in like a different sense you know Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I don't know, it was hard for, like, you, I guess, maybe you did have, like, the smaller wins along the way to where it's, like, you incrementally kind of, like, raise your own ceiling yep. in, a, in a sense. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Yeah, yeah. No, I did, for sure. Like, I started, I mean, my first camp, <clears throat> when I went to my first outdoor national after Loretta's, you know, like, I just, I drove myself, just left from there and went, Millville. What was it, 20? I think I got 25th place, you know, like, then I was there. That's all I had, straight up. <laughs> that <laughs> was what, the best that you was could a, do. That was what I had, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I knew I was good at Supercross. And there was a few other, you know, that the Plano Honda team, they they knew I could ride Supercross. That's the, I don't know how they knew, but it, that's why they signed me, not, not off of that. You know what I mean? Yeah, but it's like you just – like I, well what was your goal like not your goal but like what did you think leaving that like okay i've just got to do this and i got to do you know what's crazy is i never i never doubted myself mm. i don't know which is kind of crazy to, to think right like uh in my head i was still going to be one of the best of all time i don't know like because i knew i was good at supercross yeah and i figured the outdoor out later but i don't know this always had the self-belief i guess like it's fucking cool. It's not a lot yeah. of people. Not a lot yeah, of people have it. What? So, what do you tell your son now playing baseball? Like, what's the most important I'm, lessons you try to transfer to your kid? Just work ethic, which that that my both my boys one plays baseball, the other basketball. Like, they're all and they they're self motivated. You know, I don't I don't have to I don't have to ride them. They're. I think it's just the biggest thing. I'm I'm pretty mellow. I'm not I'm not a crazy, you know, baseball dad or anything. But yeah. They're pretty self motivated. Yeah. What are the like the? Is there any like the post game or pre game pep talks? Like, what does that consist of? Or are you I'm just pretty quiet. you're like trying to just say you're doing the Roger? Yeah, I'm pretty quiet. Just yeah. sit, sitting back, not saying nothing. I'm just pretty mellow. I'm I'm like my wife's pretty intense. I would say with sport, you mm-hmm. know, and um, I would say kind of like the genie Big Rick. Like I'm Big Rick. I just chill. <laughs> like she's pretty intense. She'll. She does. She does enough. She's that's a good cop, bad cop, almost. Yeah, it's a good combo. Yeah. And you just sit in the in the water truck with the mellow light. Yeah, exactly. I'm, <laughs> I'm the mellow with with the sports. I'm mellow for sure. Oh, uh, that's so good. It. What was? What? When did you and your wife meet? When in your career? So I'm. I, when I first moved to California, when I was 18. You just bagged the Cali chicks. Just yeah, as right quick off as the you bat. Could. Yeah, I was, I was at the 24 Hour Fitness in the gym. I met her there. Yeah, what's that? 20, 25 years or twenty four years later. Really? So was that even through like the living in the back of the truck era? Right after that. Okay. Yeah. So like the year after that. Mm-hmm. That's pretty sick. 
so I, I did that time in Texas, and then, um, well, basically, kind of still lived that the back of my truck. I was I lived at that place in Paris, which I didn't even have a bedroom. I had this little like corner area where I had a bed, you know, like ghetto. You, you wouldn't even imagine this place, um, which was in Paris. But I would drive to the to the sh- our race shop, uh, Plano Honda they had a race shop in Corona. So that would go to the gym right there off of uh, McKinley or whatever. And that's where I met my wife, Teresa. And yeah, just with her sense. That's so sick. So she was there from, from the start of it. Yeah. It makes a difference. I think so. For me, like, I, there's that whole other side of, of getting distracted, right? And yeah. I felt like that, that helped me just stay focused on my stuff. And yeah. And just having a good girl in your corner, you know, like, luckily I, I met her when I was young, you know, and yeah. It's crazy the difference, like, I, I I don't know if you can relate, but I I feel like the 99% of the time I'm like the man and I'm taking care of shit and I'm fucking doing it and I take care of my wife and I like, everything's on me for like 99%, but then it's like that 1% of the time when you just want to like, you've got nothing, yeah. you know, and like to have to have a person that can like lift you up in that time it's like as important as the other 99%. Yeah, 100%. And it's very underrated. And I, I didn't know of that until I kind of like had that. And I wouldn't, sense. honestly, I wouldn't know any different because I mean, 18 is pretty young, you know, like yeah. been together a long time. I wouldn't, yeah. What's the tips to stay together for that long? Stay together, grind it. Just, it's stay, not, it's, it's, just yeah, stay like together. honestly, right? Like it's, everybody has their highs and lows. We've, you know, and stick it out. It, It'll get better. Mm. Respect, I would say, is the main thing. Yeah. Yeah, because life is very long <laughs> when it comes to that. And it's know. a roller coaster, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a roller coaster. So you just got to stay on, stay on track, and it'll get better, right? Like, it goes through its, through its phases, just like life. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think... I think people give up on it too quick. Yeah, but I mean, I know there's situations where yeah, but it's too easy to yeah. give up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it's a. Uh, I mean, I didn't even really think about getting married. To be honest, like I ended up getting married, but it's like I didn't wasn't like a thing I'd put that much attention to, or even like really. Yeah, I mean, it always said I was never going to get married. Really? Yeah. Well, just because I don't know, I grew up. My parents got divorced when I was. 14 mm. and just I was basically kind of on my own from there you know just doing my thing and saw what it did to I don't know I just I was like I don't want to ever deal with that you know what I mean so and then it just changed when you yeah met. just you know I met her when I was 18 we were together I think five years before we got married yeah it just it was time I guess yeah it's funny I I read a book and it talked about uh compounding so like you, you take fifty grand, you put it into the, the stock market, and you never pull it out, and it's like it's the compound effect that does all of the work. Yeah, and it's like fitness. It's just going to the gym for ten years. You know, ten years of going to the gym every day, over two years of going three times a day. It's just yeah. that compound. It's time, and then in the, the book basically said the same thing about relationships. And I, that, that I think was the thing that probably changed my perspective on it. I just, and like with my, my wife now, like, yeah, we had some fucking crazy, like we had separated two years through COVID and like, yeah. it was bad. And there was so many times I wanted to dip, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. but it was li- I literally just had that in my mind where I was like, fuck, it'll just be, then it'll be the next chick. Then it'll be the next shit, like the next time I want to dip, the next time. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it, it was that kind of thinking where I'm like, I would just see it as pulling my money out and losing the compounding yep. a- effect, yep. if that makes sense. But I'm, I'm like, sure you're looking back now, you're like, dude, glad oh, I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, the further along it goes, the, the, like, I guess the more you build your life together too, the, the more you think like you couldn't do it without. Yeah. That, that person in a sense yeah so i can't imagine what it's like after 20 20 something years yeah that'd be like be odd to even think like yeah but yeah it's a cool it's it's cool to like 
it's cool to hear it too from from a guy like you as well you know like I, I feel like marriage and that whole it's got like a different v- connotation these days maybe or like it maybe it's again maybe it's just like what we're talking about with mcgrath it's like you've got so many options you've got instagram you've got yeah. all the all the shit it's like maybe it's sort of the messaging gets lost with like all of the new distractions and everything you know yeah for sure it's changed man <laughs> sound old saying that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah listen yeah, yeah. listen to listen us to it. <laughs> Uh, well, mate, we've we've probably played, probably done three and a half hours. Yeah, right, yeah. I've uh, I've loved it. Yeah, that was good, man. Yeah, I'm glad, thanks for having me. It was, it's cool. I haven't done too many podcasts. Just yeah, you know, I've done where you talk about your life. Just just sit and talk about life. Yeah, it's yeah. Good. No, it's awesome, man. And and like I said, you're a, you're a dude that I just had. I just frothed on it. Just that was peak. That was my, <laughs> my peak, you know. And, dude, it was a good era. It's not- and it's just cool to, like I said, you meet guys that are actually as rad as you want them want them to be. You well, know? I appreciate it. So, what's the next couple of years looking like for you? You found a pretty good home at Triumph. You think? Yeah, yeah. So doing the Triumph deal. Actually, I'm just coming back from an injury. I blew blew my ACL out early earlier this year. Um, so I just got back on the bike last week. So it's a long process. Six months. You know. What's, what done. surgery did you get done? I did a cadaver this time. You did that, yeah. yeah. Second one on this one, um, but yeah, it's been solid. I'd... Have you been out? Have you been like you hit like peptides and shit like that? Now that you're not competitively racing, have you done? I that haven't. Yet? No. Fuck. Wonder if you you ever looked into any of that mm-hmm. stuff, stem cells and shit. No, I haven't. Have you got any like lingering like bad injuries? Not really. Like no, you... like I've had a lot of injuries. because you got a lot of a lot, injuries. A lot of yeah, injuries. and dude, I've been been pretty fortunate, I guess. Found some good doctors along the way, you know, having Dr. G kind of there along the way to help me. And yeah, I guess just having the right people behind me. The Mexican genetics. Yeah, maybe that <laughs> maybe that helps too. Huh? <laughs> but yeah, definitely de- definitely didn't lack in the injuries for sure. Yeah, because I, I feel like the, um, dude, I fucking, I literally just like snapped the dude's elbow in training the other night. Really? Oh, bro, it was fucked. He just refused to tap. Like just one of those. We went in there last. I hadn't seen him since, and his elbow, man. Like it literally just, it stopped being elbow. You felt felt it go. Oh, bro, it was sounded like, you know, you know, like can, thick canvas. It sounded like you know you cut a bit of canvas and you like that sound, dude. Really? And it went from like being, you know, with you know, like twisted behind the back, whatever, and it just was like all resistance, like, and then just completely nothing it just made this huge rip sound completely nothing and anyway it was like it was a couple of weeks ago and it, it, the dude was at training last night he tied his fucking arm into his belt so that he couldn't really? couldn't use it and i was like fuck man that's like, hardcore yeah i was like how's it going <laughs> like it looks pretty swollen like yeah he, he can't barely move it but anyway he's like ah oh, bro i'm just fucking shooting it with peptides really <laughs> and i'm just like god damn son but i haven't Touch wood, I haven't had any injuries recently, but yeah, I feel like I'd be just getting on BP, BPC one five seven or whatever right. it is. I've heard of that. Yeah, okay. Maybe, maybe should look, I'll look into it. Is the knee good now though? Yeah, it's it's yeah, solid. Yeah, but I, t- I I mean I took it pretty seriously. You know, obviously just with my therapy and tr- training, and yeah, got back on the bicycle pretty quick, and yeah, I've been hitting it hard. So, would was the is the cadaver surgery the move over the other ones you did? He my surgeon said for my age and it being my second one that was what he recommended. Yeah, yeah. And so, what's like your deal with Triumph? Like, you think that's just a thing? You're just gonna stay there and keep keep grinding away? Or I I hope so. I, I you know it's pretty cool to get on at the ground floor right mm-hmm. from when it starts and be pretty. You know, we're gonna obviously learn a lot along the way, but it, it'll be just cool to eventually win some races and win some championships and be a part of it. That would be cool to stay involved with it, you know? And obviously I can only, you know, test say Supercross at that high level. I'm 42 now. I don't know when that'll run out It'll, at some point. Right. Yeah. I won't be valuable in that, that way anymore. So, but you'll still be valuable. In um, other ways. That's where I'm, I'm trying to learn on the other end, like just the engineering and trying to learn on that end, which really intrigues me. So trying to learn to so where I don't eventually I, have a value on not throwing a leg over a bike, you know? 
Yeah. And you'd have to think even just working with some of the guys too, you know. No, for sure. I feel like you and Julie could get on pretty well. I yeah, and I, I not saying I want to get out of the coaching deal. I I, I enjoy the coaching, but the technical mm. are all that intrigues me a lot more. Just for whatever reason. So I don't mind the coaching stuff, but I, I really I'm really intrigued by just the engineering side of of motocross. Could you be like a desk dude, like sitting at CAD designing parts and shit, you think? Yeah, if I was able to get out to the track too. Mm. You know, like I, yeah, I you'd I, need I a like, balance. Yeah, I like geeking. I don't mind geeking out and doing stuff like that. But yeah, if I could go see it on train, you know, still be involved in that way. Yeah. I wouldn't want to just be hundred percent behind a desk, no. Yeah. What have you got any like inclinations of where you think some tech is gonna go? Like KTM, they I just did their twenty twenty four point five launch or whatever. Yeah. The, Have you seen any of the new stuff that they got in that thing? No. Fuck, it's sick. Really? So they got it's got the lit pro is like on the front mudguard, right? But then the ignition, dude. So like I've been riding the Stark a bunch, and that thing you pretty much just ride with no engine brake. It's fucking insane. Like yeah, just yeah. freeze the entire chassis of the bike up. And then you get on a 450 and it just literally feels like someone's dropping an anchor behind you every yeah. time that you want to stop, like every time that, it, not even hit the brakes, just roll off the throttle, right? And this thing, just slide it, get rid of it. So you can just fully tune it up. Yeah. Yeah. Like, which I, which I obviously dealt with that on the racing side, you know, but like, that's pretty cool. It's getting to the production so you could do that with through your phone or something. Yeah, yeah, just literally Bluetooth. And it's like I went uh, – basically it's like – it was like one to five on on the parameters. So it was like engine brake, um, throttle response, like, uh, traction control. Um, so I pretty much just went like one for throttle response, two for engine braking, and yeah. it just fully mellowed, hmm. just mellowed the whole thing. It's actually a Glen Helen, the first moto of the World Vets, I – had the I, I just fucked it up and i had the engine braking like way up on the thing Jeez. oh bro and it was so rough and i'd be like slowing down in the turn it's crazy the whole character of the bike changes right oh that's massively and like i just could not i couldn't carry momentum into the turns because you'd, you'd either be like on the gas like through the bumps mm -hmm. but if you'd let off like the bike would just be oof. like you feel like you had to have it cracked even just a yeah. hair to keep it so like dr yeah dragging yeah. your way through yeah. but yeah so then then like actually seeing the difference for moto 2 to like i went i think it was like 70 engine braking and then went to 30 and yeah. like the bike just completely different in in every way so but do you have any like mm, from like from here where is it gonna go yeah, like what do you think <laughs> I mean, it's hard to say. I, I mean, electric, but I hate to say that, right? Like, it's coming. I just don't know. I just don't know for like racing, like that. That would suck. I think. Mm. But no, I shouldn't say it'd suck. It would just be different. It, yeah, I was gonna say it's probably just like really different, and you'd lose some, but you'd also. But then, yeah, I don't know. It, it will be cool to be able to ride, maybe ride places you couldn't ride before, right? Yeah. So I don't know. I'm not anti-electric. Well, I am old school, but <laughs> <laughs> but think about basketball players don't make much noise. The what? Basketball players don't make yeah, much no, noise. No, no. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like there's a ton of sports where it's that essentially silent. You know, like that was one one thing. Uh, do you, you get into UFC at all? Yeah, like or like back in the day when it was not as of recently, not so much. No. Well, through COVID, they kept putting on fights with no crowd fuck bro game changer really oh the sounds man the sound of yeah, yeah. You, you lost the crowd vibe but the sound of like the impacts of just like shins on dudes fucking skulls really like up. just it it kind of added you you'd say like i'd probably rather the crowd but then when you heard some of it and like some of the shit talk like the guys in there like that you never normally hear dudes talking to each other it was just it, it gave it like this whole different yeah, feel yeah i could know? see that so i wonder like if you could you'd actually hear dudes on the you probably wouldn't hear them from the from the stadium talking but, shit to each other yeah, oh there'd have sure. to be some like start line and stuff like that <laughs> hopefully we're a few years away from that yeah i hope so i hope so all right mate well thanks again hey eh? yeah i appreciate it, it was no awesome. worries man we'll uh we'll do it again yeah it'd be good hopefully i have some good news stories
Fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are excited to announce the launch of our new membership site, gypsytales.com, packed with exclusive content and perks that you won't find anywhere else. This is your chance to become a part of the Gypsy Gang. And as a special bonus, if you sign up to an annual membership, you'll be entered into the draw to win our custom-built TC125. Gypsy Gang.